Sure. So uh, welcome everybody. It is good to start as soon as possible so we can uh, finish in time. I am Ali Hriyatoğlu and uh, responsible for uh, organizing this with my friends uh, from the Joint Research Center. I am at Koch University. Uh, today we will have Edin Zuret as our chair. Uh, he's a computational linguist, uh, he's a computer scientist at Koch University, and he's uh, advisor, scientific advisor of our uh, emerging welfare project. We have been working with him for three years, and it's great that we could get his time uh, with some last-minute stuff. So he did really adjusted his pro program for us. So before we start, I would like to share uh, our panel session information. Uh, we are going to uh, have one hour discussion uh, with uh, at least two panelists, Doug Bond and Philip Schroth. And uh, please uh, let, uh, let me know in a private message in Zoom or by email if you would like to comment. Uh, I will uh, share uh, our topic so it will be easier for us to uh, <clears throat> make the best of this one hour if you have some structure and if you have any additional suggestions just let me know so i closed my video while i was trying to share the screen uh, we all have these experiences in these days and we are expert in zooming like the word googling the zooming will become another word so i hope you see my screen uh, can i get any uh, yes, it's yes visible. Yeah, and the slides. Uh, today uh, we are uh, that we, as useful and general as possible. We try to define it like what can be features of uh, or what are the essential or uh, uh, features of valid and usable AI generated event data sets. You can say automatically uh, generated as well. Uh, and the main aim is to trigger a debate among system developers and event data users. And both groups are quite uh, wide and uh, people really uh, try to define what is possible, what is needed. Uh, and the subtopics, uh, a main aim can be, you can add more, uh, how would you feed the models of conflict processes or just null casting to understand the, the conflicts uh, and uh, possibly if anybody want to use uh, forecasts? The subtopics are uh, minimal event. What can be the event ontology, uh, possible uh, typology to feed models of sociopolitical military conflict and related processes across the frame of the ontologies? Uh, Philip Schrott uh, has introduced one yesterday. Uh, and any additional suggestion uh, or comment on this, uh, or whether it is really possible, because everybody has a different interest, how would they match? Uh, event metadata specification. Uh, could you please mute your... Uh, Microphones, it is not easy to keep up with 50 people. Uh, minimal levels of statistical actually. correlation, uh, error rate with respect to gold standard data sets, and which level of granularity of geographical aggregation should be aimed for. It should be countries or cities or villages, uh, and whether quantitative assessment of the impact of inadequate sourcing on the validity of AI generated data sets like what kind of sources you would use or what kind of uh, experts you need for this. Uh, I will uh, tell about these topics at the end of the session, just to remind you, uh, and the, the panel will start after half an hour after this session ends. So it is half past one uh, UTC. Uh, I'm not going to write to me from the chat if you have any question or if you want, would like to contribute and I will uh, take care of the rest. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm just stopping my sharing screen and give the word to Dennis. Okay, thank you, Ali. So before uh, starting our session, I just uh, wanna uh, say that I'm sorry I won't be able to attend the panel due to a prior engagement, but one uh, topic uh, that uh, I think is important uh, that I would uh, like to be discussed in the panel is the quality of the data 
So I have spent a lot of uh, uh, wasted effort on trying to build models on uh, data that has low internet rate agreement, uh, which ends in frustration. So I think um, in any panel discussing data, that, that should be sort of uh, one of the foremost um, things, how to, how to uh, ensure the quality is high and how to ensure we can actually, we have a target that we can uh, train algorithms for. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to start our session. Uh, the first talk is analyzing ELMO and Distilbert on sociopolitical news classification. And Berfu Bukers uh, will present. Uh, can I share my screen and presentation? Uh, absolutely. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I am Barfu. I am participating from Turkey. Um, I wish everybody a beautiful day. Um, this is a comparison study between well-known natural language uh, representations, uh, namely Elma and Distelbert, on social political um, text classification. Okay, uh, this is our outline. Um, for those of you who uh, who have to leave uh, <laughs> extremely early, uh, this is the nutshell of our uh, observations. Um, uh, but uh, this is going to be more meaningful uh, after we define our experimental setup. Mm, today, NLP researchers uh, focus on creating generalizable models uh, to produce satisfactory outcomes for a um, variety of real-life data. Um, for this, they focus on building task agnostic models um, and unsupervised learning become useful tool uh, for creating such models in um, short uh, time because uh, with this uh, we can utilize unlabeled data and as we already know uh, labeled data uh, creating it uh, becomes uh, a pain um, so uh, the main motive is uh, here to create big universal language representations um, recently some very successful attempts uh, taken place. Uh, for example, Elmo, Bert, and Transformer. Uh, they performed surprisingly well on a um, variety of NLP tasks. Um, uh, we can simply embed th them to, to our uh, models uh, as pre-trained, and we can also fine tune them uh, in our uh, labeled data. Um, and with small label data, we can get uh, very satisfactory results actually for uh, various NLP tasks uh, with these pre-trained models. And, uh, but there is still, uh, examination. We, we still need to examine them uh, thoroughly. Uh, we need to understand uh, why and how uh, they perform uh, really well. Um, to be able to build on top and uh, create better uh, models. Uh, one way is to do some um, extrins extrinsic evaluation on uh, as many different data and tasks. Um, in this study, we do extrinsic evaluation of uh, these two models on two different tasks. Um, one is political news, uh, classification of local political news articles, the other is sentiment analysis on product reviews. Um, um, to challenge our data, so, sorry, to challenge our models uh, to bring uh, some difficulty uh, to our setup, um, we utilize um, some experimental setting which was already defined um, 
in a recent lab um, that I'm going to mention uh, in a minute. Uh, this setting is cross context setting um, and named as cross context. Um, mainly, uh, we train uh, the models on one data set and test them um, on a data which is uh, distinct from the training data. Uh, for example, this cross context um, experimental settings can be realized by um, utilizing uh, data from uh, different countries and domains. Um, uh, the first task is for test news classification. Um, we try to classify local newspapers of India and China. Um, we use um, only India data as training uh, set um, and we uh, test our models uh, in uh, India data, in test portion of India data and China data. Um, as you see in the table, uh, these are uh, relatively small data sets uh, and uh, they are they are imbalanced uh, in terms of class ratio. Um, so this, uh, this task is uh, basically to um, ta tag news articles as uh, whether they include uh, protest events or not. Mm, this is binary task. Um, uh, this is um, local uh, news uh, coming from India and China newspapers. Uh, so this brings some extra challenge um, because um, how protest events are manifest, manifested um, highly depends on the culture, um, which includes language usage, time, space and actors uh, of that country. Uh, the other task is sentiment analysis. Uh, this is exhaustively uh, used uh, task and data sets, uh, actually, movie reviews and customer reviews. Um, so this, uh, this data set is sentence level and balanced. Um, we use only movie reviews as training data here, but as cross context data set, we use uh, customer reviews data. And um, here, uh, this is not a sentence level. Uh, these are uh, news article documents. Uh, composed of multiple sentences, most of the time. Mm. Elmo and Distilbert are uh, entirely different models. Um, they were pre-trained, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, and they were pre-trained on different uh, training objectives. Mm. Uh, one is bidirectional language modeling, the other is mask language modeling. Their pre-training uh, data are entirely different. Their uh, architecture is uh, different, LSTM-based uh, versus transformer-based, uh, or um, even uh, their case sensitivity is different here. Uh, we also use um, non-neural baselines uh, to compare uh, with our neural models. These are multinomial name base and uh, support vector machine. Um, we take bag of words or TFIDF as inputs for these models. So uh, our uh, word representations uh, do not contain any word orders or context information here. Um, we generate our word representations with um, Elmo distilled or uh, other uh, simpler uh, techniques, and then feed them into two different uh, classifiers. Um, one is feed forward neural network, the other is bidirectional long short term memory. Um, we designed our experiments um, in a way that uh, we, as I already mentioned, uh, we train in some data and test in another data, uh, which is called cross-context setting. Um, and then um, we, all, uh, we, uh, uh, we also report uh, uh, regular, 
results of regular uh, test data, uh, so not cross context, uh, we uh, name it as null context. Uh, we train in a single GPU uh, for 10 epochs with Adam optimizer um, and all our models, we uh, train them five times with random seeds and uh, report their averages. Um, okay, uh, so our first experiment is uh, we do not uh, fine tune Enmo or Disturbed. Um, we just take them as pre trained uh, weight vectors and feed them to feed forward, forward neural network. Uh, let me explain the, um, this table and column names here. Uh, this N test, uh, I needed to uh, use generic names here in these tables because uh, I merged uh, two uh, task results here. So this N test uh, represents uh, null context, uh, F score, C test, cross context. Uh, for example, this C test of uh, um, protest classification task. Um, is for the result for uh, the China uh, data. And uh, for sentiment test, this is the result for uh, customer uh, reviews data. Uh, and also we defined some uh, other scores um, to be able to uh, evaluate robustness of uh, these models uh, in contexts which um, we defined it as a performance decrease uh, in percentages uh, from this uh, null context uh, test uh, to cross context test F score. Um, if we if we examine the results, uh, this still part uh, seems slightly better than Enmo, um, but uh, the results are very close uh, actually. Uh, in experiment two, we uh, again use feed forward neural network, but this time we fine tune uh, Enmo and this still part. Um, so we change our their weights uh, according to our training data. Um, here, uh, as you can see, and we cannot fit uh, full uh, text input uh, to the to single GPU when we fine tune Elmo. So we needed to clip text. Um, this uh, two two fifty six was. Uh, our predefined um, maximum uh, number of words, uh, but Enmo couldn't achieve it. Um, so these uh, protest classification results are not entirely comparable, uh, but uh, as we can see, um, if, if we use small, smaller context for a protest classification task, uh, Enmo actually gained a better results than uh, this Tilbert, but um, we can, so we cannot be sure about, uh, we cannot generalize this as a generic behavior. Um, but we can say this Tilbert is, um, this Tilbert can uh, more easily uh, utilize longer sequences than Elmo. And this is expected because um, Elmo is LSTM based and uh, LSTMs are uh, known to be known to handle um, long sequences. Uh, uh, they have some uh, issues for uh, handling long sequences. Um, in experiment three, we use our Enmo and Distilbert as given. Uh, we fix them um, as we do in uh, experiment one, but we uh, change our classifier to by LSTM. Um, so we can uh, view by LSTM usage as um, we bring some uh, extra task specific contextualization um, to our model. Um, so we actually expect uh, to uh, gain better results for our task. Um, this, this is true for this Silbert. Um, for a time, time and space uh, limit, I, I couldn't um, bring the results of uh, multiple tables here in this presentation, but um, if we 
Okay, if we compare experiment one, this divide result, and experiment three, this divide result, uh, by, we see that this divide benefits from biolistian usage, uh, but um, actually, ANMO couldn't uh, benefit from it uh, as such. Mm. In experiment four, we fine tune ANMO, fine tune uh, our representations, and use uh, biolistian. Um, so uh, the common observation of these four experiments is that this divide, um, it, this divide seems to be uh, a, a little bit better than ELMO uh, in both null and cross context uh, and this drop score. But this is a very similar score, so uh, we will need to uh, do some statistical tests for it. Before that, uh, let me share our baseline results. Uh, as you can see, uh, in null context um, and also in some uh, cells of cross context, baselines uh, can actually be comparable to ELMO. Um, and also, uh, even distilled bar, they can be comparable, they can have comparable results. But uh, in cross context uh, performance, uh, we see. Uh, especially in this uh, sentiment analysis, um, these baselines can uh, perform poorly uh, compared to uh, the neural uh, models. Um, so when we see training time and model size, um, this, this is uh, E size, it stands for embedding size, model size and training time. Uh, these are the uh, column names. So when we uh, see, when we, if we can see that this divert is uh, smaller and much faster than ELMO uh, in terms of uh, training time, it is much faster. Um, also baselines are very extremely economic uh, than they are compared to neural models. We performed randomization tests uh, between um, models, uh, their result, uh, between uh, model couples uh, which have similar results, seem to have similar results. Uh, so we uh, applied randomization tests uh, between ELMO and Silbert and uh, ELMO and baselines uh, for two tasks. Um, the results were seem uh, very close uh, of uh, ELMO and the survived performance seem to be very close in experiments, but um, the p-value of the uh, randomization test was uh, very small. Uh, so um, uh, with respect to this test, we can actually say that the survived is significantly uh, better than ELMO uh, in this uh, experiments. So we can, as a conclusion, um, we can say that uh, these contextual neural models are superior over um, traditional machine learning, um, especially when we want to transfer from uh, some different training data to test data. Uh, but we can, um, if we have, if we are short on uh, time or uh, space. Um, we can uh, we can view this traditional machine learning models as lo low cost alternatives uh, to those uh, complex models, and this third part uh, is um, seem to be lighter, faster, and uh, more effective than ELMO in cross context text classification. But uh, we we have to note that these conclusions are only valid under this specific experimental setup. So this is uh, this should be viewed as case study. What we could do better, uh, we could compare our non-contextual -context uh, embeddings to non-contextual word embeddings, like below. Uh, we could apply some error analysis um, on top of these numeric results and uh, interpretation of hidden states of uh, these neural networks could be very interesting. Um, 
So uh, we should note uh, we should uh, note that uh, pre-trained uh, models are uh, trained uh, entirely on entirely different corpora. So uh, this reduces the fairness of comparison. Actually, um, uh, we also uh, want to want to remember that remind that um, we cannot compare uh, this. Uh, results of this uh, evaluation to other evaluation studies because um, each evaluation study has their own experimental setup. Um, so this actually um, uh, prevents uh, NLP community um, from gathering uh, all these uh, informations in a systematic way. Um, and if we if we could uh, compare the results, actually, uh, we could. Um, we could accelerate progress, um, and uh, and it would be uh, useful to define some some standard systematic way of uh, doing these evaluations. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, and uh, this is going to be um, we believe this is going to be uh, real uh, with uh, collaboration. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Berfu. Mm -hmm. um, we have some time for questions and uh, please use the raise hand feature if you can uh, in the Zoom menu. Okay, Adi is raising his hand physically. Mm -hmm. uh, should I uh, exit presentation? No, no, you, you may have to go back to a previous mm -hmm. slide. Uh, hi, Darfu. Uh, do we have the chance to see you? Oh, yes, Not a question, course. actually. Uh, just for the interactivity. Okay. Anyway, just uh, mm -hmm. as a general comment. My question would be whether you have uh, performed any error analysis, like what kind of cases are correct uh, always or wrong always, and what you observed in the data, not just the numbers, but mm -hmm. what was your uh, observation? Hmm. Uh, actually, I uh, didn't do some very comprehensive observation uh, uh, on the outputs uh, of uh, on the um, on each sample uh, and uh, the predictions. But um, when I uh, randomly um, examined uh, some uh, okay some observations, uh, I, I can derive from that. Uh, for example, um, the, due to the maximum number of words, um, some very critic uh, parts of the news articles are lost in input. For example, uh, it contains uh, very critic uh, keyword like protests or demonstration, etc. Uh, so, uh, the, as we expect, uh, the models fail in them. Um, I, I also um, Applied uh, some other tests, McNamar tests, uh, and but I couldn't, uh, I didn't uh, include uh, the results of this test in, in this presentation uh, because of time limitation. Yeah. Uh, but um, um, in McNamar test, uh, we see that uh, we actually um, look for um, specific uh, prediction differences. Uh, for uh, of the uh, input uh, for uh, multiple models. So uh, in McNamar test, we focus on um, which uh, samples, in which samples these models uh, differ and in, in which uh, samples, in which por portion of samples these uh, models, um, uh, these models uh, do not differ. Uh, so I uh, did some kind of analysis um, with McNamara Mac test, uh, but um, so the, the, but uh, I, as I said, uh, it needs further examination uh, with, with this error analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we have one more question. Lauren uh, AFV. Yes, oh, thank hi. you. Um, thank you so much for the nice presentation. Um, 
it's nice to see what you're working on and it's actually very related to my master thesis so it was uh, very good to hear about your work um, what I'm very curious about was uh, I think at the end you mentioned that um, that there's several of these kind of comparisons around in mm -hmm. NLP but that they um, don't you can't compare these the results of these kind of studies um, why exactly not could you say a little bit more about that Hmm. Uh, for example, there are um, comparisons between Elmo and Bert. Um, uh, this comparison uh, actually was uh, done by creator of Elmo, uh, and it is a really nice uh, experiment and study. Um, but um, for example, the data is different. Uh, training data is different. Experimental setup is extremely different. Um, uh, actually, um, when I um, when I uh, ignore these differences and compare these models, uh, which I did in my thesis presentation, but um, <laughs> uh, this was not uh, this was not approved uh, by <laughs> my uh, jury uh, by my uh, okay this was not uh, approved uh, because uh, I cannot compare them. But uh, when I compare them, uh, anyways, uh, I saw that um, th there are some. Uh, similarities in the results, actually, but uh, I cannot bring them uh, with a confidence uh, into, uh, as a conclusion, uh, because, as I said, uh, the case study uh, setup is uh, entirely different. But um, if there is a way, uh, if there is a way to do this, um, it would be great. Uh, and um, do you think it, it is possible uh, to derive some observations uh, by comparing? Uh, research studies, mm. although uh, experiment setup is different. Right, so what you're saying basically is in order to compare different studies, they need to be conducted on the same data with the same mm -hmm. setup, right? Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Barfu. Thank you. Um, well, our next uh, study is on text categorization. Uh, for conflict event annotation, and uh, Frederick Olson will be presenting. Hi, um, thank you. I will try and share my screen, uh, but I think Barfu has to stop sharing first. Okay. <laughs> thank you for the presentation, Barfu. It was very nice. Thank you. Uh, how can I? Okay. So let me see if I can get this working. Um, this is actually the first time I've done a presentation like this sitting in my bedroom. So I think this is one of the, let's say, benefits of having this um, working from home set up like this. So uh, is there anyone that cannot see the screen I'm sharing? You should see a slide saying something with the text categorization for conflict event annotation. Yes, we can see it, Frederick. Good, good. So my name is Frederick Olson. I'm a computational linguist. I've been working in the field for more than 20 years. Um, I'm at the RICE Research Institute of Sweden uh, in the NLP group there. And this is joint work together with the Department of Peace and Conflict Research in Uppsala, which are uh, <clears throat> responsible for the uh, Uppsala Conflict Data Program. So this is work done together with them. Uh, I will see if I could, I have a lot of menus on my screen. I'll just stop touching things now. So what did we do? Uh, we did a comparative experiment concerning the kinds of annotation tasks that the uh, manual annotators do uh, when they are reading uh, news items for the purpose of annotating data for the com uh, Uppsala Conflict Data Program, right? So. Uh, what they do is when they see a news item, they essentially categorize that in, in, with respect to 17 or actually 19 different tasks. Uh, so we were trying to replicate this in a sense, uh, using state-of-the-art text representations like Elmo and BERT, that has already been mentioned, and ULM FIT. So the purpose of this study uh, was to see if we could help them become more efficient and effective as annotators. Uh, because they have a, a, a tremendous setup. They have a, a lot of people working on this data set. They are experts in the field, obviously, and they are really, really fast when doing the annotations. But we wondered if there was actually things that we could help them with. Um, and to do this, we had to start somewhere. So um, 
uh, we started with these exper experiments uh, and I would like to jump to conclusions because uh, I could talk about this at length. It's very interesting. Uh, it's, um, so let's, let's just jump to conclusions and then we can go on with, with the, what we have done actually. So what we saw in this is that there's obviously a, a large performance variability both across the different tasks, tasks that we were trying to address and also across the different methods. Uh, it turns out that the best methods were the ULM fit uh, and the fine-tuned BERT and the pre-trained ELMO. These are all uh, uh, methods, as, as, as Berfa mentioned, methods that uh, sort of lev leverages data uh, that may not necessarily come from the particular data set at hand. So they could be pre-trained. So we use transfer learning for this. And this is something that happened in the NLP field as late as, I think, 2018. Uh, in, in a more concise manner. Uh, and it's also worthwhile pointing out that this particular setting is very simplified. So we assume that we have one piece of text and one event. So there's no, there's one one-to-one one -one, um, um, relationship here. So there's, there's not one text with more than one event in it. And, and this is crucial. Um, and we did this because, well, the rationale is if we cannot have machines perform uh, you know, in a good manner on this simplified setting, they will never perform good in a more realistic setting. But we still think that the rank order of the models uh, will hold when moving to a more complex setting. Uh, so this is the approximate outline of the talk. Um, uh, I will try and rush this a bit because it's really interesting questions. I, I just want to point out that the, 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 the questions before, uh, after the, the previous speak talk was about the data quality or data availability and, and, and you know, um, comparing studies. And I think this is why this field is so interesting because this is real data for real tasks. And when we as natural language processing practitioners when we work on algorithms, we have fixed data sets and we tune our algorithms to that, those data sets. Uh, and this is a, like a mix and match. So this is really, really interesting. And this is more, more let's say, um, real world applications of techniques. So I will first talk about the annotation and the data. Uh, then I will talk a bit about the text categorization experiments and a bit of the results at the end and I've already deviated from my plan. So anyway, um, this is what a Uppsala config data program, UCDP annotation workflow, what it looks like essentially, a bit simplified. Uh, the person doing the annotation sits down at his or her uh, computer, uh, types in a few uh, search terms in their, in their news provider's interface, uh, retrieves a list of news items, decides uh, in, in their head, uh, essentially, by looking at the results, if there's anything new in there, uh, if there's anything, first of all, if the, if the news items there are actually relevant to their task, which is to annotate the data of conflicts where people have died, um, and also if, if the news items they're seeing is actually contributing anything new. If this holds, then this is what we work with here. So then uh, the person starts looking at the text and annotating it uh, with respect to the geography uh, at different levels, uh, the participants in the conflict, number of deaths, deaths and, and the time for these uh, events and so on. And, uh, and in this manner, uh, UCDP uh, staff digest approximately 50,000 news items per year. Um, and this is their tasks if more or less what they're doing for each of these news items. They're looking at the time of events. Uh, they're looking at a bunch of different granularities of the geography, um, uh, starting with uh, the name of the place, uh, the name of the region, the country, different sorts of administrative regions, and so on. Uh, they're also looking at the participants, if there's a, a state or government side involved, and looking at, at other participants. Um, also a name of the conflict if it's an ongo ongoing one. Uh, and finally, they're looking at the number of deaths um, for different sides or different parties in the conflict and the civilians uh, casualties as well. Um, and when they've done this, 
uh, they aggregate all this into their public data set that they release. I think it is at least once a year, which you can download and uh, work with. Um, uh, yes, and this is why we were working as a te text categorization uh, setting instead of an information extraction one, which would be more natural than coming from a computational linguistic uh, background. Uh, the difference is that in an in, in information extraction uh, setup, you are actually extracting, looking for things in the text and extracting them. Whereas in this categorization, uh, text categorization task, you're looking at an, an entire text and try to uh, apply labels or uh, predict the categories that it pertains to. Um, Let's see, yes, I mentioned all of this previously. Uh, let's turn to the data, which is in all our projects that we have, not only this one, the, the data is what it starts with and usually what it ends with. Uh, in this particular case, uh, they are using a proprietary data provider. Uh, the data cannot be shared, unfortunately, uh, without uh, you know, specific um, permission from the data provider. Um, that is the text data. They can uh, and they do uh, release the, what they call as the georeferenced event data set, which is the aggregated uh, outcome of their analysis. So what we're working with here is a combination of their public data set and their inter internal database uh, that they produce while annotating the texts. And, and one part of the annotation is that they are uh, copying and pasting snippets of texts that is sort of evidence or backing their decision to do a certain annotation into their database, into their annotation tool. And this is what we have to work with. So there are sometimes full text and sometimes just snippets and sometimes it's even um, annotators notes and so on. So we worked with uh, almost 32,000 records in English uh, published between 1989 in 2019, uh, all in all, a bit more than 12 million tokens or that words. Um, we are assuming or we have taking measures to have a one-to-one -one mapping between the texts and events. Um, and each textual, textual record may consist of one or more distinct news items. Um, this is the distribution of the number of words in the documents. Uh, so on the y-axis you have the number of documents and on the x-axis you have the number of words in these documents and as you can see if you look closely is that this is not really a linear um, scale on this x-axis because because um, where I wanted to cram in also uh, the longest ones so uh, the shortest documents are cons made up from three tokens uh, the longest one is almost 33,000 tokens but on average, they're around 400. This is just to get an overview of what we have to work with. And then it's usually very beneficial to look at the actual data. As someone mentioned previously, uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, working with data and trying to model things uh, just to realize that the data is dirty in, in senses uh, that prohibits uh, a good analysis. So um, in this, I made a small, um, standalone web application. Uh, if you're not familiar with the framework called Streamlit, I, I encourage you to look it up. It's really easy if you're Python people, and yeah, this is maybe 40 lines of Python code to make an application like this. Uh, so I could look at these short texts. Uh, these are one, two, three, four, five examples of short texts, uh, the headline and the text. And as you can see, there's not much information in there. There's also a very long text. Um, this seems to be a complete report. This is not a news item. Uh, and there's also, of course, mix-ups uh, between the markup that's provided by, by UCDP data provider and, uh, and real text in a sense. Just to make like a data wallowing application like this helps a lot in, in gauging your hypothesis regarding the data. Yes, let's turn to the tasks that we have addressed. I mentioned the, uh, each annotator uh, solves about 17 to 19 tasks in their, in their work. 
Uh, can you see the entire screen or is something? Let's see. Um, yes, we can see the entire screen. Good, because I have a window blocking. I'm not sure if I. Uh, if we only it. see we only see the presentation window. We don't see other windows. Perfect. Okay, this ta this table is there to explain in in a, a nutshell what the annotation tasks or categorization tasks really are. So from left to right, the label is the actual type of, of annotation uh, that is done uh, or a categorization. Um, description says something about the task. The number of classes in each task uh, is there to <clears throat> um, to sort of highlight that this is a really skewed data set. So of the almost 32,000 events that we are having, <clears throat> if we look, for instance, at, let's say, type of violence on row four, which is if it's whether state-based, non-state, one-sided, there's three classes in that task. Uh, and I can unfortunately not see the class entropy, uh, which I will uh, explain in a minute. Can I actually, uh, hang on, no, I'll just have to ad lib this. Um, class entropy column is a relative measure to just get a, a view of how skewed the different tasks are in terms of evidence for each class or each label. Um, so type of violence is, uh, if I remember correctly, quite a low class entropy, uh, which means uh, it's quite easy. It should be quite easy to, to um, uh, learn this one. Whereas we have a label called where coordinates, which is the name of the place of the conflict, which contains a whooping 4,125 classes. Um, this also means uh, that this, well, not necessarily, but it's an effect of this, that the class entropy is quite high, which means it's quite, uh, let's say it's, um, well, uh, it's, it's quite hard to guess what, what, uh, uh, what label it should be uh, or what class it should be just based on uh, looking at the occurrences, which will bring me to the must beat baseline in, in a bit. So. Let's look at the um, where coordinates a bit more closely. Uh, this is, I believe, the first 50 uh, most common classes within this task. Um, and as you can see, if you're disregarding maybe the 10 or even less, uh, eight or nine first or most common classes, uh, the distribution of the labels throughout this, uh, this task is, is quite even which means it's quite hard to uh, know just by looking at the occurrences which one it might be. Uh, and also, since there's so many, 4,125 classes uh, spread across uh, uh, a bit less than 32,000 uh, events, there are really few instances per class to learn from. So this, this task is expected to be very hard. And it, as it turns out, this is also um, one of the classes that the human annotator has problems with, with doing. Whereas if we look at the most, which one, the, the one that is expected to be the easiest one, which is the type of violence, just having three different classes. Um, there are many instances to learn from, and you could, if you just guess one of them, you could get a, end up with a high, high performance, which is well, not necessarily good then. So uh, that's it about the data. So let's turn to the uh, experiments. Uh, this is a highly skewed data set as, we, as we've seen. So we do precision recall and F1 score, not accuracy. Uh, we do five-fold cross-validation using a stratified sampling approach, uh, 2080 splits, but only for, not for the ULM fits. And I will tell you a bit later on why. Um, we use the same seed uh, and splits across the methods and in total this were, I don't, don't remember exact number, but more than 100 experiments and it took a couple of weeks to compute um, on a standard, um, well, gaming rig, essentially. Um, the baseline that we must beat is the random baseline. It looks like this in, in Python. It's essentially drawing randomly based on the distribution of the classes. Uh, the one that we should beat is the uh, TFIDF based bag of words, uh, which also Berfu uh, used. This is a from a from a computational linguistics standpoint, it's it's um, 
it's sad, it's disappointing that uh, things like this uh, turned out so good because we would like to have more linguistics or more informed language processing in our methods. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, this one performs pretty good. So what we do is we have a com we're com combining uh, n-grams, uh, sequences of words, as well as, as characters in this to, to allow for some variation in, in the words and so on, missing, missing words. This is the baseline that there are methods should be actually. And these following uh, slides are all explained in the paper and I will not go into technical details. Um, we also used uh, an, an ELMO classifier, also um, something that's pre-trained, and this is uh, not at all in this experiment. Uh, actually, it's not at all uh, trained on the data that it's seeing and used for, for classification on later on. Um, we also used BERT, um, which is, a, a, let's say, a sub subsequent model for, for modeling language. Um, came, I think, uh, six months after Bert, uh, Elmo or something like that. Um, and then we fine-tuned BERT also on all the texts that we uh, were actually having, all the 12 million tokens. Um, and we did it for 10 epochs, um, not that much, but it should pick up a bit more language or language use um, by that. And finally, we did the U ULM fit, which is the universal language model and fine-tuning. Um, and this is turned out to be really good. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting method for several reasons. Um, not, not the least that it's quite computationally efficient. Uh, so you can actually run it uh, in, in a production environment uh, without having access to TPUs. Um, I'm, I have a timer. I see I'm almost running out of time. I will skip this one. Uh, I think I will go to this one, which is a hard to digest results table. What it actually tells you are a number of things. We have the tasks on the left. We have the number of classes after that called CLS. We have the entropy in the column after that, just to remind us of the skewedness of the data that we're looking at. Then we have the baseline, uh, which is, as you remember, the random guessing. Uh, this is the one that we uh, must beat. And then we have the bag of words. Uh, by the way, the dot F stands for uh, F score. So these are all F scores that you're looking at. Um, the bag of words uh, after that, and then there's Elmo and BERT and BERT fine-tuned and ULM fit. So uh, let's see where to start. Look at the where, where coordinates. Uh, there are gray areas for uh, bag of words, Elmo and BERT. It is because on top of this method, we used a, for the bag of words, we used a linear lo logistic regression uh, method for Elmo and BERT and, and BERT fine tune. We used a, a random forest nonlinear classifier on top of those. Um, and it's simply too much. This machine that where I was running on uh, broke down and it's all, it's still a 250 gigabyte of RAM in that machine. So it shouldn't be a problem, but it tells us that these uh, sheep methods will not scale, at least not in this, this implementation, uh, when you are looking at many, many classes. Uh, same thing goes for the ADM underscore two further down. So the grayed out cells is no results because of this. Uh, the other highlighted cells, that is dark background, uh, is the best ones. So uh, we can see um, that the best one overall, I would say, is ULM fit. It's, uh, improving over all baselines and over all the other methods quite significant, significantly uh, for all uh, class or sorry, all tasks that involve predicting categories. But then we have the deaths and the number of deaths of civilians and unknown and the estimates, which are all more or less numerical, then ELMO is the best one, except for a few cases. This is quite interesting, and this is something we don't know why uh, ELMO is much better than this uh, than the other methods for predicting this. We, we, you could argue that this is not really a classification problem, but a regression problem. But still, uh, in this setting, it, it could be treated as a classification problem since the data set we're using is closed. 
So this is something that we hopefully will have time to look into further into. Um, results, yes, we see it's, um, we have a large variability of the best results uh, from 60 something F F1 score to 99.8 in F1 score. Um, ULM fit and fine tuned BERT are best for categories, whereas ELMO is best for numbers. Uh, bag of words is cheap and good baseline that you should always start with, I would argue, um, but it doesn't really scale with a large number of classes. So circling back to the initial issue of being able to help uh, use the P annotator to work more efficiently, I would say that uh, we could probably use this kind of setup um, and inform um, their decisions to make in their annotator interface by pre-populating the, the interface uh, with certain values given a text. Uh, and I, I expect if that's the case, I expect that we could uh, cut the time of the boring and repetitive tasks that they are good at, the annotators are good at, because the classifications uh, seem to be good at the same kind of tasks, and then the annotators, the human annotators, could focus their work on doing the more, uh, more detective work that it has to be done. Uh, and going back to conclusions. Uh, the, the same, same slide I started with, it's that we see a large performance variability. Uh, we did, did not do much hyperparameter tuning in this case. Um, uh, still, we could see like distinct clusters of performance or, or a rank order between the classifiers and the different methods. Where ULM fit is the best one, fine tune BERT and pre trained ELMO after that. I have to say that this was work done late last summer. And there has been lots of, of improvements in, in the field of natural language processing since then, actually. There's new models almost every week. And if I were to redo this, I would probably do something else in BERT, uh, actually. Uh, and I would expect to see something better than ULM fit as well. And also remember that this is a simplified setting where we expect there to be a one-to-one -one mapping between an event and a text, which is not what you have in the real world. Um, Yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank I you. Think I, I think I, I think I was on time, right? Yeah, yeah, you were. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. Otherwise, I would have started to raise some flags. <laughs> okay, so we have some time for a couple questions for Frederick. I think uh, Osman has raised his hand. Osman, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Frederick, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, can you please go back to your uh, tasks and their uh, explanations? This one? Yes. Um, so the, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so you said your goal is to help your uh, annotators. Yes, uh, so in the long run, yes. They don't just search their uh, search for some news, but use your tools to, I guess, uh, speed up their annotation process. Well, that's that's <laughs> the intention, the intention or, or the dream yeah. at least. We haven't gotten that far. Uh, so, uh, for example, the var, var co coordinates task, yep. Yep. Uh, you have 4,125 classes, but yes. uh, in real data, like you said, this is uh, actually unlimited, right? Yes, but it turns out this is um, the name of the label is, is, I think, poorly chosen because there are not actually numerical coordinates. There are actually names of places. So I, I agree, there are an approximately or almost infinite number, but there's no, they're not actually coordinates. There are names of, can, of places. We can say the same thing about that's, that's too. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with real data, then you must see that uh, like aiming to do this as a categorization yes. task would be like, I guess, uh, unachievable in, in some sense. Well, yes, yes and no, I would say, because um, well, if we step back to, in the perfect of worlds, this would not have been carried out as a text categorization task. It would be a, an information extraction task. And in an information extraction environment, you would expect to be able to pick up new where coordinates, for instance, whereas in this particular setting, you don't. And this is an effect of how the UCTP people are actually working. Yes. And this is also an, exact, uh, an effect of 
this is real data and this is the way they work. But I would say that if we could devise a categorization scheme, uh, in, including the, the certainty of the categorizes. So let's say that, uh, let's say that there is a 4,125 classes, uh, or actually maybe say four, if, it, if it's not already, but there should be one class of unknown in there. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, every time the classifier predicts something that is un unknown, it should be added as a, a particular um, item that the uh, annotator should look at and fully fill in. And then and there's a feedback loop and then you retrain the classifier and so on. Uh, so it, I, I think I still think this is possible to do this as a text classification task, but you have to bring in the whole um, user experience package of, of the annotation process and how you work with this data. Um, so I agree with you. This is in, in it's not feasible to do it a one shot uh, learning and application in this sense. Uh, so uh, that's 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 totally true. Yes. And also, uh, if this would have failed, if this if this setting would have failed, uh, this is a close, nice to work with data set. It's not changing, but still, if it would have failed for some reason, then we would have known that there's no no use at all to try and, and do this in the in real life. So this sort of gives us the confidence of, of taking this further. I think. But I agree with your initial statement. It's, it's not feasible to have a one-shot classification task like this in the real world. I agree with you saying that, that there can be a compromise, like introducing an unknown uh, class. Yes. Yeah, that is totally feasible, but you would, you would need further uh, testing and comparison I guess, yes. with, with uh, other like information extraction tasks. Yes, exactly. Uh, so uh, when we work with clients across the board, we usually think uh, in three, uh, I think this is a management consultant term, ORD. We try, we try and optimize existing uh, processes and then we redefine the pe way people work and, and eventually they might be disrupted and work completely differently. This is a, an O, an optimization thing. We don't want to go there and, and force them to change their uh, the way of working. So this is a, like more or less a proof of concept instead. Yeah, th this point uh, leads to my next question, I guess. Uh, so you said that you, you're doing it this way because this is like closed data set, right? Yes. Uh, so I, I would have liked to see, I guess, like b because you are, uh, um, because this is not the usual way to do it, the categorization task is, dealing with as a categorization task, I would I would have liked to see a comparison of uh, the the normal way, I guess, <laughs> of doing this as a as an information. Yes, yes. Task. That would be like really, really helpful uh, to your case, uh, to your yes. uh, uh, point that this can be actually dealt with. Deal, yes. Deal well, the, I agree. I agree. And this is what we initially thought we could do before we actually started working on the project. We have done some, some testing of existing tools and, and I don't have the numbers, but it didn't look well at all. So the problem again is that you have to, uh, you have to have the training data to, to train the components uh -huh. of a text information extraction uh, yeah, system. And, and I think that's always, um, always the problem in these kinds of well, settings. At least, um... Yeah, but you would need test data, of course, of course. Yes. If you didn't okay. train your own, uh, let's say, NER place uh, finder, mm. because there are many tools out there, mm. you would still need test, test data. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, yes, let's thank our speaker. Um, um, Unfortunately, one thing that uh, I'm still not getting used to in Zoom is having a, you know, um, the crowd clap for the speakers, but I guess uh, we'll get used to it and find the replacement. Um, our next talk is on TFIDF character engrams versus word embedding based models for fine grained event classification, a preliminary study. And Guillaume Jackie is uh, going to present. Or maybe not. Yakub, are you going to uh, present? Oh, it's me. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was misinformed. Um, so please go ahead and. Can you see my slides? Not yet. I'm just the backup in case. <laughs> okay. Okay.
Can you see the slides? Um, I don't. Not yet. I'm seeing your um, you on the camera, but I don't see the slides yet. I did, do you think there's a permission problem? Does everybody have a permission to share screen? We don't have a, sorry. I think everybody has a permission to, to share the screen. Okay. Yeah, we don't have any explicit uh, allowing or uh, disabling of this feature. Okay. But it is tricky to share stuff, uh, screens or uh, windows in Zoom. So it's out five that I press. Can you see it now? Uh, oh, no. Okay. So when you look at the bottom of your Zoom window, is there a share button instead of a yes. key? So can you try to use that one? Uh, if you want, I can open the slides for you or Julian. Yeah, that would be great. Then, then I will tell you when to switch the slides. Okay, uh, Julian, are you ready to share the slides or should I open them? Yes, yes, I can do it, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We, we, see. we can see that. Yeah. Let's make okay. it maybe full screen. Okay. Yeah. Is it fine? So, go yeah. ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, this is a joint work uh, of me and uh, Guillaume Jacquet. Uh, we, are, uh, uh, we, we will present a, a sort of preliminary, preliminary study on comparing various lightweight machine learning methods uh, for fine grained event classification. Um, and uh, we are ba we are basically interested uh, uh, to uh, uh, to develop uh, an a fine grained event classifier. We are working mainly with uh, news, so on uh, on short text snippets that is uh, scalable in terms of quickly adapting it to new languages and to new domains. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, and the purpose of this study was basically to gain a better understanding of uh, how much training data do we need vis-a-vis uh, -vis expected uh, classification accuracy. So the specific scope of, of, of this work that uh, we are presenting today is to explore uh, how SVM-based uh, models uh, uh, perform. Uh, on the one hand, we have the character engram uh, uh, model and we compare it against the um, state-of-the-art word embedding based models, uh, Glove, Bet, and Fastex. We use them basically as features to train uh, an SVM. Uh, and we also, uh, since it is a known problem that actually a large uh, scale data sets for this type of work do not exist, at least not to our uh, knowledge. So we uh, picked up uh, low-hanging fruit, which is the ACLED data. Um, please go to the next slide. As you as you already learned on the first day, day uh, it is a human moderated data collection uh, uh, in the context of the armed conflict location and event data project, uh, and it consists of. Uh, uh, more than 600,000 uh, event records uh, reporting on, on uh, social political violence and protests across uh, uh, a couple of continents. And these records contain information on the location, on the fatalities, but also there is some textual information that resemble uh, text that you find in the news. So uh, it was for us sort of like bingo, you know, we have to do something with that. 
and the um, event taxonomy of ACLET con consists of six main event types and uh, they're all subdivided into 25 more fine-grained subtypes. And here uh, you can see uh, two examples and uh, you cannot deny that this looks like news, but actually the reality is a little bit uh, not that easy because there's also a lot of uh, noise in this data set in terms of uh, uh, orthographic mistakes or some added metadata by, by the annotators uh, uh, on, for instance, some comments on how, uh, how certain location was encoded, which does not constitute really a text in the news. So we had to, we had to clean this. Uh, please go to the next slide. So here you, you can see the overview of the main event types in ACLET and the corresponding subtypes. Uh, uh, for someone working on, on event extraction, the main types might uh, sort of look familiar if uh, you think about the ACE program and some DARPA programs. However, if you look at the, the subtypes, the nuances between the, the event types are uh, small. For instance, uh, as regards protests, uh, uh, there are peaceful protests, protests with intervention, excess, excessive, using excessive force against protesters. I mean, here the nuances are uh, pretty small. Uh, and uh, please go to the next slide. So uh, what we what we did as regards the cleaning? Well, first of all, we removed every every type of uh, symbols that were not bearing any content, like quotation marks. There are also a lot of markers at the beginning of the of the event descriptions. I mean, the free text uh, free text part of the event records that clearly indicate what the event type might be, and we cross checked it against the names of the event types and subtypes and we simply eliminated it. Uh, then uh, we also dis uh, disregarded event descriptions that are of less than 20 characters because they are not informative. Um, and we also removed uh, some additional comments uh, added by the, by the humans as said earlier on, on, on that provides specific information where the information came from, whether from news or from some NGO or, or, or which were related basically to the way of coding. Uh, so here you have uh, uh, the, distri uh, the distribution of the, um, of the main event types. Uh, which is not so bad. Uh, actually, the situation it's it's not even, but it's 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 not dramatic. Well, the situation gets a little bit worse as regards the subtype events because we have two subtype uh, subtypes which are represented only by a couple of hundred uh, um, event instances. Please, next slide. So here you see the event description length distribution. So most of, most of the data is between uh, 30 you know, to 400 characters long. So something which is similar to the corpus which was presented in the previous presentation. We found there also some outliers like of 2000 characters. We kept them for now in this corpus. Next slide, please. So what did we actually compare? So we uh, uh, compared four models. The first one is uh, TIDF character engram based models. We used three to, uh, uh, to five engrams with L2 normalization and uh, sublinear TF uh, calculations. For GLOVE, we used the 300 dimensional vectors trained on Wikipedia and the English GigaWord corpus. And uh, we computed the average uh, for all words that were found in the, in the um, event uh, textual uh, description, whereas the words for which uh, GLOVE could not find a lexical entry, they were basically discarded. Uh, then we used the BERT embeddings, uh, also the pre-trained uh, 768 dimensional vectors uh, a multilingual, uh, the multilingual case model. And here we compute, compute also the average for all words. And I will clarify this because 
this uh, uh, seemed to be uh, seemed to cause some confusions uh, with the reviewers. So there's a one paper which we cite from Rimas and Jurevic, uh, where they compare the performance of uh, using ver the average uh, com uh, average vector. Uh, uh, resulting from the from the web transformer vis-à-vis uh, -vis, um, using the CLS token or uh, even the fine-tuned word uh, um, for specific domains, and uh, they report basically that for those seven tasks, uh, using the average uh, vector, which is basically also uh, the easiest what you can do, uh, uh, was more or less performing uh, in the same way as the other. Uh, option. So uh, there's a citation in our paper uh, uh, where you can find this. And this was some eval, some evaluation uh, tasks. And the last model uh, that we uh, compared is fast text. Uh, we used the 300 dimensional vectors and they were trained on common crawl. And also here we computed the average vectors. Please, next slide. So we used the scikit-learn, the, the, the linear uh, SVM. We did the tenfold shuffle split cross validation with 75-25 uh, training test speed. And we actually learned uh, one versus one uh, uh, classifiers. Uh, so for each pair of classes, we, we trained the classifier and the one that had, uh, uh, we used the ma majority vote as, uh, as uh, in order to select the, um, the event type. We then run uh, uh, experiments using different portions of, of ACLET corpus uh, for training purposes to see how the different models compare with a uh, different amount of data. And we used, we used recall precision mac and macro and micro F measure um, for evaluation purposes. So first, let's uh, let's quickly uh, discuss the event subtype uh, classification. So again, this these are the 25 event classes. Uh, as you can see on the left hand, the micro F uh, measure uh, we already get with a very tiny fraction of the corpus, quite good results uh, above 70, and. Uh, Surprisingly, or maybe not, the character engram uh, uh, SVM uh, is better, and uh, the um, word embedding based models they converge to, to something around 80. The macro precision is uh, the macro F measures, uh, which you can see on the, on the right uh, uh, side of, of the slide, is uh, worse. Um, uh, this is this is uh, this shows the difficulty that there are some classes that are more difficult than the others, but again, uh, uh, the character engram model is better than those, let's say, baseline word embedding based SVMs. Please go to the next slide. Here, well, we have the more or less the same pattern. Uh, the the glow, uh, the, the character engram based more SVMs uh, outperform the the other three. Uh, models that we compared, uh, all of the word embedding based models converge more or less to the to the same maximum uh, score. Uh, and we can opt, uh, I'll now we switch to another one. Okay, that's good. Uh, and we can uh, observe that uh, recall is uh, significantly more uh, difficult than uh, precision when we talk about the macro scores. The next slides, please. We also did, by chance, uh, the experiments on the, on the main event types. Uh, and you can see here that this is uh, significantly easier because both uh, micro and macro F measures uh, already with a, a small chunk of the data. The 0.5% of the training data corresponds to something like 2,250 event descriptions. So next slide. Well, you can also see here that uh, the, the distance between the GLOVE and the, uh, the character engram-based models and, uh, and the word embedding-based models is, is huge, actually, running on the full uh, uh, training data, which is 75% uh, uh, from the 600,000. So just to give you a quick, uh, quick summary, of, of the of the results, so uh, the 
in our setup, the TFI DF character engram based model outperforms the word embedding based models already, uh, already with 15,000 of uh, event descriptions. Mm, um, and uh, 83.5 macro and 92.4 micro score could be achieved on the full, uh, exploiting the full data uh, set for training and, and testing. Uh, we could, uh, with relatively little data, as I said, 250 uh, um, event description, obtain uh, uh, scores above 70 uh, in terms of the micro F measure. Uh, for obtaining uh, scores above 60% for ma ma macro F1 uh, requires from 45 to, to 225,000 events. And uh, GLOVE uh, uh, seems to perform best uh, in this, in our experiments uh, setup. The next slide. Basically for the event type classification, um, uh, we have the same observations that the FIDF character engram based model outperforms the others. Uh, the um, running uh, training uh, uh, this model on, on the entire data set uh, uh, re uh, resulted in, in uh, uh, micro and macro F scores way above 90%. Uh, and GLOVE is the best among the world uh, embedding based models. So next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about the error analysis. So we compared uh, the, 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 these four uh, models that we've uh, uh, compared and uh, findings were more or less the same. So this is, uh, therefore I will only show, um, only talk about the um, confusion matrix, which you can see on the slide, uh, which uh, refers to the TFIDF uh, character and engram models. So, uh, most of the errors are within the main event types. So you can see here in the left, uh, uh, in the left upper corner that there are some clashes within the battle category. And uh, these errors are mainly because of the new uh, uh, small nuances in the, in the definitions of the, uh, of the event subtypes. So you have uh, uh, there something like government regains territory and non-state act or ter overtakes territory. So probably the le le lexical differences are uh, relatively small. That's why uh, this happened. The same thing uh, you can see for the, for the protest somewhere in the middle in this confusion matrix. Uh, uh, the best main event type, uh, uh, for, uh, best in terms for the best scores for the event subtypes is, is, the, cate uh, is the category of explosions and remote uh, violence. For, for this, uh, for subtypes in this main type category, we uh, uh, achieve best, uh, best results. So there are two, uh, two specific event types which clash, clash most with the others, which are armed clash and uh, with all the others and uh, attacks. But this is mainly to, due to uh, mm, uh, the fact that they, that there's, they are basically uh, overpopulated in the corpus. Uh, there are some, uh, also some misclassifications uh, that go beyond the main event types. And uh, this is also uh, something that results from uh, the nuances in the definition. So there are categories re related to regaining or, or overtaking a territory of a certain country, but are in the different, basically in the different basket. One is in the battles, another one is in strategic developments. Uh, um, and uh, yes, we, uh, I mentioned earlier that, uh, that uh, there are some event subtypes which have very few examples uh, uh, in the, for which there are very few examples in, in ACLED. And um, they uh, did the, the performance as regards this specific uh, categories like chemical weapons and uh, headquarters or base establishment. They did not perform that bad, actually, vis-a-vis uh, -vis other sub event subtype categories. Uh, the next slide, please. 
Yes, so, uh, obviously what we did has uh, many limitations. Uh, this is just a preliminary study. Uh, we just we just use SVM and and uh, with linear kernels, and uh, we also did not use uh, we didn't we didn't uh, uh, form any domain specific tuning of the uh, of the BERT embeddings, uh, and uh, the Aklet corpus uh, although we spent a lot of work cleaning it it is still uh, it is still uh, uh, not free from uh, from noise, but it constitutes, in our opinion, very good appro approximation uh, of uh, of uh, what uh, corresponding text in uh, news would look like. So, as regards the future work, uh, we want to we intend to extend the range of machine learning para paradigms. In particular, we, we intend to uh, uh, exploit uh, nonlinear uh, kernels for the SVMs. Uh, Actually, we have already some results of the experiments with fine-tuned BERT-based uh, uh, neural networks. I will say something about that in a minute. Um, we also intend to com combine the, the TF-IDF character engram-based approach and the word embedding-based approaches. We intend to further clean the ACLAT data and uh, Actually, if anyone in, in this environment is interested, we have a couple of versions of that corpus uh, uh, that were al already processed by, the, by a, a syntactic parser to eliminate uh, stuff that is not uh, grammatical or does not look like uh, news. We also intend in the long term to, uh, to create uh, out of ACLET uh, um, something multilingual. Don't how we will do it. And uh, we also, uh, given the main objective, which I mentioned at the beginning of this study, uh, we also intend to, uh, to create some corpus uh, that will uh, come from the, uh, from the news, the headlines and a couple of leading sentences uh, per, uh, which will constitute the event description. So I mentioned earlier that we, we already did something more sophisticated with BERT. You have seen before that the gap uh, uh, between uh, the TFIDF character engram SVM versus the, the best uh, word embedding based uh, 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 SVM was more than 10%. So on a, on a um, uh, let's say, significantly modified ACLED version that resembles more the news, filtering uh, a lot of noise, we achieved uh, a similar results with fine-tuned BERT. So uh, mm, uh, uh, we, we, are, we are getting somewhere with, uh, with the, with the BERT-based uh, mm, uh, approach. So this is more or less all. Uh, I am, yes, if you have any questions. Thank you, Jakub. Uh, we have time for one question. Uh, just can, can you hear me? I, I couldn't. I can cannot uh, raise the hand because I'm the host of the meeting. So I oh, just go to the, no the chat. Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Go so, ahead. Uh, first of all, thanks, Jakub, for the be very nice presentation. Actually, very very interesting piece of work. Um, on the direction of maybe estimating the, uh, it's more like a, maybe a suggestion, more than a comment, more than a question. But um, in, in the same direction of like estimating how much this. Uh, uh, kind of text uh, on which you, you, you perform this classification task approximates well the uh, news text. Um, maybe it would be interesting to evaluate, I mean, to, to take into consideration, let's say, the, uh, the let's say, the, how, how the, the deviance, let's say, on the, on the, on the scores uh, for the different categories for that, that text. Uh, sorry, let's say, let's say like something like a standard deviation or something like that, because I imagine that uh, one of the problems with, with the news text uh, uh, that the news text poses is that, uh, let's say, the, 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 the reporter doesn't have in mind already uh, the event type that is actually describing. Um, so there is normally the, the, the problem that you, you have like a complete or related similar or related event types that might, in which you might, you might classify the same piece of text. While maybe I, I can imagine, although I, I'm not uh, an accolade annotator, so I but I can imagine that um, uh, in this kind of uh, ACLED reports, the annotator has already chosen the type of the event. And then in, in this 
the text uh, that he's writing in order to uh, describe it. He, he already he kind of already chooses which kind of information uh, uh, to, uh, to report. So in that sense, maybe I guess because I guess you 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 classify you you use let's say the class that that your classifier for which the, your classifier returns the highest the highest uh, score. Let's say, but um, would be maybe interesting to see how how close the the scores for the other classes are. Um, and maybe having a, um, um, let's say, an estimation about how this makes the task more difficult, because I, I imagine that this will be clo more uh, clo closer to, a, to a, let's say, a, um, uh, of, this, of this, to the situation of a, of a normal, of a standard news text, when you typically have a conflicting or similar events that you can apply, and then you have to choose one uh, which is mm, the most prominent or um, well, I don't yes. know if I made clear the, the point. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we 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 have been discussing that the problem in the past. Uh, also, in the previous presentation, it was mentioned that uh, the scenario was one text, one event, and uh, we. Uh, if you look, I think I think if you look at the, uh, the definitions of the ACLET uh, event uh, types and in particular the subtypes. Uh, they have uh, guidelines on their web page, and yeah. uh, and uh, 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 let's say we have a uh, there is one category about peaceful protests, and then there is uh, something about protests with intervention. Well, I would imagine that there could be peaceful protests with intervention still. So uh, the, probably the borders are sometimes blurred, and uh, uh, having an having an evaluation that takes into account not just one system, uh, what uh, one single uh, output, but maybe uh, uh, doing an evaluation, something like uh, uh, reciprocal rank, or and and then then. You, you could define the similarity of the event types. Uh, that could also be a better way to, uh, uh, to uh, for, for the evaluation. Because if you, if you guess that the uh, peaceful protest is a protest with intervention is, is, uh, is, is better than if you classify a peaceful protest as a, a, missile, a missile attack or something like that. So I think that definitely we need uh, more uh, uh, um, I think for 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 uh, in the context of operational use of any any AI solution in such a context, uh, such metrics would make more sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Jakub, for a great uh, talk. Uh, the last uh, talk of this sec session is. Uh, Conflict event modeling, research, experiment, and event data limitations. And the presenter is going to be Stefano Ferry. Thank you. Thank you, guys, uh, for, for inviting us to the conference. Thank you, Ali, Risto, Erdem, and Vanni. Uh, thank you for organizing this very interesting conference and, and for inviting us. Uh, my colleagues, Marie-Sophie and, and Mikhail, will present an experiment that actually do use a classified data set, and, and we try to make prediction using it. In this presentation, uh, uh, we will present the limitation. And we, I, if, if you allow me to do this provocation, it is very interesting how to make up uh, the code in order uh, to have a better classifier. But in the end, as a user of, um, of the of data set, it is also very important to decide what to put into our uh, dictionary in order to be used, for example, for um, a political escalation situation or for a conflict. This is very important to evaluate which stage uh, in the political or social evolution are the one that matters and are the one to be observed in order to have then an effective data set well classified. I let you the floor to Marie-Sophie okay. for the presentation. Um, I hope you can hear me and see my screen. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. Thank you, Stefano, for this introduction. So, um, we are part from the Peace and Stability team um, of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. 
and uh, we are very happy to present you today our conflict event modeling experiments. Um, I will uh, shortly start uh, with an um, introduction on what the peace and stability team actually does um, to give you a context of uh, our research. Right. So the peace and stability portfolio um, um, contains three main projects uh, covering the entire conflict cycle. So we go from early warning and conflict prevention with the Global Conflict Risk Index to uh, situation awareness and monitoring with mapping exercises. And we also have a project on uh, post-conflict recovery on land use and damage assessment in urban Syria. So our uh, research today is uh, focusing on the early warning and conflict prevention part. So the global conflict risk uh, is a newly published uh, index that uses 25 quantitative indicators, cover, I mean, integrating three, six uh, risk areas, so including economic, social, security, political, and geographic uh, dimensions. And it measures the intensity and the probability of conflict uh, in the next one to four years worldwide. So we, we rank 191 countries. Though the model is very robust and has an overall accuracy of approximately 90%, there are two main limitations to it. So uh, it's based on structural indicators that are reviewed um, yearly. And um, so it does not really allow us to capture real time events, right? And also the definition of our uh, conflict um, dependent variable uh, is that uh, I mean, uh, defined on the UCDP data set that only looks at events with more than 25 uh, battle deaths. And so uh, because of these limitations, we want to also look into uh, conflict event modeling uh, in order to integrate and disentangle uh, the stages of the conflict development and escalation or the escalation cycle using big data and neural networks uh, to monitor conflict risk roll right in almost real time. So the idea is to be able to signal potential triggers to violent conflicts, such as demonstrations, strikes, or election-related violence. Under the assumption, an increase in material conflict events goes along with a decrease in material and verbal cooperation. But uh, I will let my colleague Mikhail um, uh, explain this in more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marisol. Hello to everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, as uh, my colleague said, our main assumption is that an increase in material conflict events goes along with a decrease in material member cooperation. Keeping this in mind, we picked up the CAMEO as the classification schema that uh, we want to rely on. The CAMEO, as you may know, classifies the event data in four primary classes, verbal cooperation, material cooperation, verbal conflict, and material conflict. And as also Professor Strode mentioned to his presentation yesterday, these primary classes are subdivided into 20 major other categories and several subsections, so as to create, to create a detailed classification scale. For instance, within the verbal conflict uh, subsection, you can see that they are clearly mentioned all the typical evolution stages of social unrest. Demand, disapprove, reject, threaten, protest. You can even translate it as appeal, accusation, refuse, escalation, riot. It's the same. This is the other assumption that we want to follow this escalation to predict the material conflict. For our research experiment, we use two available news media data sets that are both based on the Cameo schema the IQs and the GDELT. You might be familiar with these two data sets. We all know very well how they work. Very brief introduction of this. They both have a similar long time coverage and global geographical coverage. In particular, GDELT uh, starts uh, from 1979 while IQs from 1995. However, there are some differences. For instance, the language coverage differs as well as the, the update frequency and the source availability. For the purposes of this experiment, the update frequency is not really important as we will aggregate the data on a monthly basis. However, the source unavailability for IQs at least 
is important because we are not allowed to, to validate the output and the input. Uh, as Professor Schrod also mentioned yesterday, and during this three days workshop, we discussed extensively about the limitations. In terms of validation, we took a sample of more than 800 records for eight countries for GDELT, because we know the URL that we can validate it, and we checked for the following errors, duplicates, misclassification, irrelevant articles, and unreliable sources. Uh, as you can see, we found that only the 4% of the records are usable. All the rest are they either duplicates, uh, actually almost 70%, or misclassifications, irrelevant or useless articles. However, despite these limitations, we decided to go forward and set up a model based on these data sets. The model we tested is a recurrent neural network, an LSTM. Uh, this model is really well known at this time. The main advantage is that it behaves like human brain when we cannot remember some very old information and it is able to drop it. For the model setup, we first aggregate the data on a monthly basis. Then we transform the absolute number of articles for each major category and fact class into proportion of the total number of articles. We did so, so as to have us input 24 indicators in proportions, the 20 matching the 20 cameo major classes and the four matching the quad classes. Next, we used 50% of data as training and the other 50% of testing data set. Our model, it's not exactly a model, it consists of 191 independent models, one for each country that we examine, running in parallel within 15 euros of the first hidden layer, one neuron in the output, 500 training epochs, and a batch size of 72. On top of this, we have set up a conflict risk alarm system. In order to rank the countries in a most appropriate way, we compute the rate of change between the Q4, the material conflict of the current month, and the Q4 of the previous one, here called delta classification. The alarm system consists of three alarms. The first one rang when the proportion of the Q4 for the current month is a local max. The second one when the total absolute number of the events mentioned is a local max. And the third one when the proportion of the prediction is a local max. Next, we create four classification rules so as to reclassify the countries according to the following criteria. If all the three ranks rank for a country, we classify it first. In case we have more than one country that uh, rank three alarms, we keep the delta classification from the initial rank ranking. If two of the alarms for a country rank at the same time, the rank will be ranked just after the previous countries, and so on and so forth. So for, till the remaining countries with no alarms will, where will be ranking, keeping the initial uh, classification. The results of uh, our models for five selected case studies and both data sets that we run the experiment are listed in the last column of this table. You can see here that the test refers for March 2019. And in order to see how accurate is the model, uh, in estimating the percentage of material conflict events, we measure the, the RMC of the model, the root mean square error. As you can see, the RMC is quite low for both data sets. And surprisingly, is always lower for GDELT. It might ha happen due to the enormous amount of information, even if it's noise. We know that very well that it's noise in this data set, but it might be this the reason. Next, we map the predictions in the global scale, you can see that we have even negative predictions, minus 12%, or really high positive predictions, up to 30%. There is variability. Uh, we run also the test for some selected events, like the Arab Spring, and the model were able to predict it really well. However, there are limitations, and we need to continue to research, so as to overcome them. For instance, we could test plover, as Professor Schrod mentioned, as our classification schema. 
and uh, replace Cameo, which is quite old. Next, we could extend this classification skills by adding missing categories, such as selections. Or we can develop a new coder, as we know that the existing coders and mainly the coder used by GDL is quite old. Finally, we could think of applying Plover in other available COVID datasets, such as ACLED or uh, the European Media uh, Monitor. You can find us here. Thank you very much. We're here to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. Um, we have time for some questions. I have one, if nobody wants to go first. Go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for the presentation. I found it really, 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 really interesting. The, um, just, just a clarification. Um, the, I mean, no matter which uh, classification schema or uh, event typology you use, uh, the values of the variables that you feed into the model are always number of articles uh, uh, falling in those category normalize per the some some kind of an, uh, average number of articles right is that is, is that correct are always the proportion of articles compared to the other categories so it's 10 percent of articles in category q1 in the quad class q1 for instance okay i see uh, but uh, as a related question but i guess your your model will be in any case will be re ready to to be adapted to another kind of uh, data where the values of the variables will be absolute numbers of uh, uh, event records for example for a certain for, for a certain type event type for example instead of just normalize uh, article uh, proportions let's say thanks a lot thanks a lot Vanny. you're right but our main assumption is that when we have an increase in material verbal conflict, we have a decrease in material verbal cooperation. So we wanted to normalize to see the trend, you know? If we have it in proportions of the total, assuming that we have a decrease in material cooperation or in verbal cooperation, we assume that we have an increase in the other two categories. Okay, but, but this will be an increase and decrease of, of uh, event records in the other categories instead of articles falling that, that's into true, That's true, that's true. Yeah. Okay, understand. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Not just for this um, presentation, but um, you can if you have anything about the session. Okay. Um, Ali, Rani, do you guys have anything to add before we close? I don't think so. Um, we should... So the panel discussion is in 35 minutes. Exactly. No. So. Sorry. I, I was Thank trying you. to get your attention. Oh, sorry. I, uh, yeah, I probably didn't see the um, raise. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, oh, I, my, my video is actually off too, but whatever. Um, this is Craig Jenkins. I'm sitting here listening to this fascinating discussion. This paper is of particular interest to me because I've done similar kinds of exercises eons ago. And I'm curious if you could talk briefly about the moving average departure threshold, because this gets to the part of the question of how to model these dynamic processes. And it's separate from all the complexity of uh, event coding and developing the uh, data, obviously, that goes into this. But I'm curious if uh, you could comment a little bit more about your exercises with the uh, threshold points at which warning signals of different kinds become useful, and then how you would envision um, using that and how that then comes back to your net results with regard to the GDELT outcomes 
performing better. Thank, thank you for the question. I tried to answer because the audio was um, uh, sometimes stopping. So uh, actually, we we do not have threshold in in our uh, alarm system. Um, it, it, it's a ranking um, where where we just see uh, whether there is a local maxima or not. So actually, if you want, the threshold is a local maxima itself. Um, it's a good idea to take into consideration the, the moving average as well. Uh, there are many, many, many different ideas we, we are going to, to experiment to see uh, what is the best, the best method to, um, to trigger our, our alarming system. But at the moment, we just try the easiest also to, to explain to our uh, decision maker in Brussels. Um, a local maxima is, is very easy to explain because uh, you spot it very easily when you plot the data set and everybody wants to understand what is going on over there where they see a peak. And so we thought to use this methodology rather than a classical uh, moving average. If I'm not wrong, there is another paper that takes into consideration uh, the study of the GDAT and use actually um, a, moving, a moving average methodology uh, to, to study uh, the dimension increase of, of the data set. So um, in order to make the normalization of the number of articles, instead of using um, a normalization based on a moving average, we decided to just pick the proportion of the four category overall in terms of uh, in, in, in the, within the month. So doing this way, uh, we, we, we automatically get uh, within the month a normalization among the, the total number of, of news we have um, in the month. And so we did not use the, uh, the moving windows to average to, to, to normalize the news. But uh, working uh, with the full number of, of events, working with the full number of news, so without making this uh, proportion, um, a, a good solution, a good possibility is, is to use a moving average to, to do the normalization. I don't know if I answered your question. No, no, that does. I mean, that clarifies a couple of things. Uh, I mean, one, one th conclusion I came through from reading your paper was that uh, GDAL performs pretty well, partially because it has so much there. And then when you use these proportional measures, whatever the duplication problems, et cetera, and even perhaps to some degree the misclassifications, that's a little more problematic. But um, it's, it's still, it's, it's so huge that it creates a interesting, some useful signal in that respect. You, you got it exactly. How, how to reduce the, the, the issue of, of, of the GDELT or in general, the issue of the automated classification method. Sometimes it's very, very difficult to work on the, the multiplication or to go back on the classification and do again um, a, a recording is a complete uh, job alone, this one of the recording. So we, we, we went for looking uh, a smart way to deal with that and mainly to, to verify whether those signals are really useful and, and usable. So that was the point. Fine, there are, there are data set on the market. Sooner or later, we hope, thanks to this conference as well, that a new data set uh, or a new classified data set will be available. And once a, a better data set will be avail available, better prediction can be done. But in the meanwhile, there are only two possibilities. Either we do not do anything or we try to get out this, from this 4%, we try to get out uh, something that we can, we can use. But you got it exactly. What, this was the secret. <laughs> It, uh, the exercise, by the way, has a parallel to a thing that Doug Bond and I years ago worked with, you know, somewhat similar. It's not quite the same setup conceptually, but the, some, some of the techniques that we tried, yeah.
Thank you, everyone. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, I am ending the session and the panel discussion starts in half an hour. Thank you mm -hmm. for coming. So, if nobody's, uh, yeah, I guess uh, I was uh, muted. Funny, <laughs> I I I started to talk, but <laughs> anyway, I I'm, I I'm muted. Yeah, you were. Yeah, I I was uh, planning to just uh, share the panel session topics again. Uh, if anybody is still interested, I would need only one okay to start it. Yeah, and uh, when I was unmuted, I was thanking uh, Dennis for uh, his time and flexibility. You're and very welcome. Uh, we appreciate your guidance from the very beginning of the project and hope to collaborate more and more. Okay, I wish you a uh, nice, uh, stimulating panel discussion. Thank you very much. My uh, internet agreement uh, issue. Yeah, I, don't, I already put it in the slide. I already right. put it in the slides. See you guys later. Bye. Yep. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, if anybody is interested uh, in the topics, I will uh, pass the I will pass the topics uh, subtopics uh, in the chat, and maybe people come later, uh, somewhat earlier, and see the topics. Just a moment. So. Yeah, Ali. Maybe you can you can actually uh, specify that these uh, subtopics were just meant to I mean yeah. to trigger Sub a discussion, but we are actually open to and actually we are looking for uh, yeah. uh, additional uh, additional yeah additional issues that the panel. Yeah, let's see that in there. I was just So, uh, see you guys in um, half an hour. Actually, I will be five to ten minutes earlier, and Tom will be there as well. Uh, and hope to have a good discussion. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question, Ali? Uh, we are here, certainly, yes. Um, you just said an hour, but I thought it was in 30 minutes. Is it one hour or 30 minutes? Uh, it is 30 minutes. Okay, half. in 30 minutes, you're going to reconvene. Yeah, it is half. Okay, well, thank you. You too. Uh, Professor Schott, are you here? Uh, we got his confirmation uh, a while ago and uh, just to double check maybe, but you are muted, Mani. No, no, I don't, I don't see uh, Professor Schrott now in the list of participants, but he was there before, so he's yeah, probably saw, taking uh, advantage yeah. of the break now. Good, keep in touch. See you. Yeah, see you in a bit.
Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I think we can start slowly. Uh, today, uh, the Adam Yurik will uh, moderate the session. He is our PI in Emerging Welfare Project. Uh, Adam, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, I think. Can you Perfect. hear me? I hear you. Any, can we get any confirmation from anybody else? Yes. Perfect. Doc is Okay, here. perfect. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone, or good evening. <laughs> and this is Erdem from Istanbul. And, and I, I would like to welcome you all to today's uh, panel meeting. Uh, my name is Erdem Yuruk. So I I'm a sociologist from, from Koç University in Istanbul, and I am, uh, I am the PI of an ongoing uh, research project called Emerging Welfare, in which we are trying to develop automated methods of protest event collection. And I am also part of the organizers of this Aspen a, a workshop, and we are really happy to, 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 to see you today. And today we will be talking about, and with, with, with excellent speakers, we will be discussing and hearing and learning about the ways to develop more qualified, more established methods of automated event collection. And as you know, from, from a social science point of view, so, so there is a long history of uh, event collection, protest event collection in social movement and in conflict, uh, the fields of political science and sociology, and uh, which used to be based uh, on manual uh, ways of collecting information. And this has eventually evolved into automated methods and which, which present uh, a lot of opportunities and challenges. And uh, in this uh, workshop and in this uh, panel in specific, so we are trying to develop better ways of uh, coping with these uh, challenges. And specifically, this panel, which is titled Features of Valid and Usable, uh, Usable AI-Generated Event Datasets, uh, we, 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 we aim to trigger a debate among system developers and event data users uh, from both companies a computer science and social science field uh, around the minimal set of requirements that that would automatically gen uh, that automatically generated event data sets must must uh, fulfill and in an effort to be operationally useful uh, for feeding models of conflict processes and uh, protest events and possibly a conflict uh, forecast uh, and uh, today we we have excellent um, speakers and uh, two speakers, uh, Doug Bond and Philip uh, Schrott. And uh, Doug Bond from Harvard University and uh, Philip uh, Schrott from Paris Analytical Systems. And uh, so they are uh, important figures of the field and we, uh, you, as we all know, Philip Schrott is one of the founding figures uh, of the field itself. Um, and I would like to thank you very much uh, to both of our uh, speakers. And uh, we thought that uh, uh, each of our speakers can give a talk around 10 minutes uh, so that we can have some space for, for discussion and debate. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. And uh, first uh, of all, I would like to give the floor to uh, Doug Bond. And I would like to thank once again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be sharing my screen. Uh, does everybody see this? Yeah. yeah. Share screen. Um, as I understand it, uh, and I think you just paraphrased it, I've been asked to identify the requirements that are usable for forecasts ultimately. And in 10 minutes, starting now, I hope to go through five slides that. Uh, that will give some of my thoughts on this. And to begin, um, these are the subtopics and I've highlighted my annotations um, that uh, I will refer to typologies, but more uh, to the concept of modeling processes. 
I, I think the second subtopic was a no brainer for me. We should never rely on any single measure, whatever it is. And likewise with the gold standard, I believe that gold standards uh, are aimed at a particular question, research or practical. And there are multiple gold standards uh, and we ought to recognize that. And geographic aggregation, I annotate it with, again, levels of granularity. I think we need multi-level approaches. And for the last two, I'm annotating it with all as opposed to just AI, because there is a whole range of uh, auto and semi-auto generated data sets that I think uh, do not fit into a single um, category. So let me begin with the five slides. And I would posit that all observations, that it doesn't matter whether you are going to a newspaper to read or taking the aggregate or the mean or the central tendency. It doesn't matter whether you're on the ground as an expert or as a NGO doing monitoring. Everything that we do doesn't um, come close to the literal reality, but it is our particular um, view on that. And, and any ground truth is simply what we collectively uh, agree that this is a useful standard. And um, typically in this um, uh, effort, uh, we are looking uh, almost exclusively at discrete events and separately, we try to blend them, integrate, overlay them in the contexts, many different contexts. And I uh, talk about some of those here. Um, the media reports in particular are clearly a view from above. I think this has come out in, in most of the comments these last two days. And they're driven by interests. And uh, for the news media, it's clearly those who pay for the news. Typically that's governments, typically it's businesses and a few are individuals, but that is what's driving the content of the news. And we have to realize that at all times, it isn't news that is exhaustive, comprehensive for all interests and all purposes. And even on the ground, when you're looking at local news, you have individual group and institutional actors, both civil and political that are driving these data collections uh, these media uh, releases or uh, brochures or NGO releases. And I think we just have to remember that, that these are all coming at us from above. And when we turn to the view from below, which is where I've spent more of my time recently in terms of supporting on the ground field monitoring efforts, uh, most of them are government sponsored, uh, foreign government driven by their doning donors as donors and ostensibly on the behalf of either a local, national, or international political entity. And uh, again, I, I just am um, advocating that we acknowledge these things and that we don't talk about these in so-called objective terms and getting accuracy against some single gold standard. And just as equally um, important, but not as much integrated into the field monitoring activities are the civil society interests, but those two um, have stakeholders. They are driving it with their funding and their sponsors and so forth. And um, so it isn't just black and white. It is a view from above from external typically and a view from below with specific interests. And I would say it, this is where I would like to shift the conversation a little bit. Um, assuming that we're, we're doing all of this because we want to prevent violence. I mean, I think that's a, a natural expectation that we do this. And the way that I would advocate that we shift our attention more to the conditions as opposed to the outcomes of these events. And one of the measures of events is of course their impact or their outcomes. But I think we ought to be monitoring conditions independent of events as we've constructed them. And I saw in, in one paper today, or I heard in one paper today, where um, the notion of risk analyses, global risk scores um, are increasingly used. Uh, most typically they're done with the structural data, but I, I think the way to go as was shown today is with, a risk, uh, with the integration of both dynamic and structural data. And uh, another longstanding tradition is the social movement research. And uh, many social movements don't erupt into violence. Many of them do. And I think by focusing on the precursor events, the conditions, 
And in my own history, um, this is where Phil and I uh, um, had a very fruitful and lasting relationship in terms of our research effort. Uh, we were trying to understand what happened before the violent events that were being um, encoded by the machine. And so we defined new categories that were coercive, but not yet violent. And we shifted the discrete focus from violent events. Um, and, and of course, we were also monitoring cooperation, but what we weren't emphasizing was the nonviolent, like cooperation, but absolutely coercive events. And so we expanded that. And I think a lot of the fruits of that are embedded in Cameo and, and in other um, frameworks like IDEA. And I think we need to, when we go to the quadrant, which I uh, fully endorse to move to that level of specificity, because more than that level of specificity is very hard to get right with a machine. But at least when we go to that, we ought to then consider um, something between those four or in addition to those four that looks on th at things that are not violent, but that are, and they are not routine, and they, are, and they are highly coercive or contentious in the words of the social moment uh, studies. And this is what I would advocate. Um, and again, I'm broadening it out to something beyond uh, full all auto coding. Um, this, the, the approach that I'm advocating is a situational risk uh, um, focus. It's indicator based so that just like the typology and auto events uh, are, um, have parameters that are fixed or a framework that is fixed. We have indicators that are associated theoretically with um, escalation. So we develop those indicators. Um, they can be specific to a community or more generic for the globe or anything in between. And these highlight precursors to escalation. And we look at the trends, we look at the thresholds and, um, and we look at the dynamics and the way that beyond just simply deviation analysis from trends, I believe that the risk ratings as done by corporate security folks are very useful. And I would argue that the best proxy for impact at the bottom of the screen there, you'll see the impact times likelihood is the conventional definition of risk. The, a reasonable approximation of that is the current situation as rated by somebody on the ground. It could also be rated or extracted from a, a newsfeed by looking at the adjectives used to describe the situation. So I'm not restricting it to human coded. It could also be used in, in machine coding. Um, the escalation potential as rated by somebody on the ground, or again, looking at the um, pre-violent events that are being uh, warning on or signals of escalation in an auto extraction. And finally, uh, response adequacy, and that allows us to temper our equation for risk with a mitigation that might be ongoing. And so this is where I would like to shift the discussion and it doesn't displace uh, any of the focus on discrete events. Well, it displaces it, but it shifts it more to a more encompassing that recognizes the, that we're really trying to get at conflict processes and not just uh, preventing outcomes that arise out of the air because they don't. They originate in those ongoing processes that are highly volatile and to capture those across social, political, economic, and other dimensions, even environmental, in the context of uh, structural constraints that are standard, uh, standard you know, available at the, at the annual level, but really need to be uh, more in depth at the local levels. Um, and that's what I would uh, advocate as a direction to go uh, to meet the objective that was stated. So I'll, I'll end it there. Ah, thank you very much. And uh, then I, I would like to give the floor to Professor Felix Schroth, and then we continue with the questions. Yeah, um, I, I don't have thought. Uh, we don't have slides this time, but I just want to make uh, two sets of reflections. First is, is just a few uh, thoughts on, on the presentations this morning, which were, were great. Uh, I really enjoyed them. Uh, and then I'm going to take, I, I, by the way, almost completely agree with, with uh, the points Doug's making. And, and again, particularly this notion that we don't have a perfect view of the world. We have a view that's biased by 
the interests of the collectors, whether commercial or NGOs or whoever, uh, that's a huge thing. Um, and then I want to uh, address the issue, what I see is the sort of minimal requirements for what, uh, what a good uh, new system would look like. Uh, so just a couple of takeaways. I think one of the things that's confusing about this field uh, or domain, whatever, for <clears throat> uh, data scientists uh, broadly defined <clears throat> is the fact that the human coding is very, very imperfect. And it's always been imperfect. Again, we've been doing this stuff now for almost 60 years. Um, and it's all, and, and the, there's always disagreement. Uh, on the coders, and you can never completely define the uh, the you know what is and is not a particular event. It was intrinsically uh, you know fuzzy coding uh, uh, type situation. That's very different than uh, most of the stuff that one encounters, particularly the the benchmark type problems in in AI, uh, where there's a, there's a yes or no answer here. It, it's get it close enough is is fine because the humans are only going to do that. Uh, second, and again, I think this reinforces this reinforces some of Doug's points is that there are multiple uses of this stuff. So we've talked a lot about early warning, uh, which is has been around from the very beginning of event data. That uh, was the initial uh, the initial. Uh, use and is still one of the most common uses. Uh, though a thing I always uh, point out is it's not just early warning escalation, getting, finding out whether you're de-escalating is very important. And that's what Cameo was originally for. Again, we, uh, Deborah Gerner and I developed Cameo because we were studying de-escalation, successful mediation. Uh, and, and we tend to lose track of that. Um, but uh, these data are increasingly used for monitoring in a, in a variety of different ways. And again, the conflict risk index is a good example. Uh, uh, and uh, whether it's, um, and, and I think we're probably going to see them to a certain extent. I think ACLA has already been used to certain, for, for evaluation. And again, uh, assessment of, of programs, uh, particularly by funders of NGOs. And that's, that's incredibly important stuff. You want to get it right. Um, and then finally, there's the issue of quantitative modeling. This is more done in academia, uh, but but these questions like you know what what is what a development of illiberal democracies or democratic breakdowns look like? Uh, you know why what causes protest uh, attempts to repress protests to make them worse versus make them better? Uh, things like that. So so the uh, Again, this is largely academic, the explanatory model, but that is another uh, use of these things. Um, the one other point I, I think I'd make from, from the standpoint of my, my wish list is that even if this stuff is ultimately going to be human coded, and I think on some of these, you're, you really, you know, if, if you've got the resources and, and the data doesn't overwhelm you, it's really, really good to have human in the loop. And I've done a lot of these, uh, these projects. Uh, even if you can partially automate it, uh, and particularly if you can automate the, the boring parts of the job, because this stuff is very, very tedious to do. They're huge um, um, advantages. So if, if, you know, if you only automate, quote, 50%, You've, you've doubled your efficiency right there. And a lot of this stuff, particularly like geo names, geo names, you know, the database is vastly simplified things. You just enter something in when you finally figure out uh, what the result is and you've got all this nice standardized information, you cut and paste it or, uh, or hit a button and it goes in. You, you've reduced a problem that would have taken, oh, what? Gosh, well, it's hard to imagine. You really couldn't even do it. But it's taking an hour to taking two seconds, you know, once you have, once you've resolved the name. And, th and that, that sort of automation, even if it's not fully automated, is huge. Okay, so just my, my wish list um, of uh, what we need uh, in, and again, I'm, I'm going, to, uh, one thing, again, it's not one data set to rule them all. I, uh, we, we're going to have multiple data sets, and it could well be that Applet has pretty much solved the problem, you know, as long as that infrastructure can be maintained and expanded globally of the protest and, and com or a combination of Applet and, and UCDP. Um, so maybe that's already solved, which is fine if that's the case. Uh, but I still think there is a need for the general purpose event data, uh, you know, the stuff that 
it's not just it looks like cameo it looks like the old weiss set from 19 and copdab from 1965 um because i think there's a lot of a lot of the questions particularly if we can expand it to legislative and electoral behavior and and natural disaster uh and criminal behavior may or may not but that's easy to do um there's a lot of that that information if we're already collecting all the other stuff let's do the additional okay the the marginal cost of going for general purpose coding is relatively small um uh, doing pipelines uh, to, to scrape the data. We've got lots of examples. We've got very substantial projects like a, the European Media Monitor that are already doing this, but there's pipelines all over the place. There's websites that do it. So we can do that already. So let's, let's, let's code this stuff generally. Uh, a very good point was made this morning, uh, which I should have emphasized a weakness of IQs is IQs does not include the URLs, whereas GDAL does. Um, and I think there's crazy defense contractor reasons for not doing it. It's not a copyright. URLs are not copyrightable, uh, at least not in the United States. Um, and uh, the, and, you know, common sense would say, you know, URL is like a street address. You don't copyright street addresses. Um, so it, it's a quirky defense. You know, they didn't want you to reverse engineer the thing. I mean, you can do it anyway. But uh, uh, so we need the URLs uh, again for validity purposes. We need global coverage. Uh, and again, it's not that IQs is evil or anything. It's a legislative restraint on their funding. Why they can't cover the United States? And then you know, China is tough. China is really tough to cover. Uh, and and I'm not sure how and. But you know, if you've got a data set out there that doesn't cover the two major, major superpowers, uh, you got a problem. Um, the um, again, I cannot emphasize overemphasize the need for open and transparent things. The problem of of GDELT beyond the the huge, huge, huge amount of noise. So it seems to be fairly random noise, which is is kind of nice. And by the way, the the JRC, the, there's another project out of Illinois that came up with exactly, almost precisely the same number on that, but about 4% of that signal, 96% is noise. The big problem with GDOT, we have absolutely no idea how it's generated, none. Uh, whereas IQs, we've got a pretty good idea. We don't have it all. Well, there's no reason for it to be using a data set like that in, in 2020. Uh, there's all this stuff out there that's completely open. You can put together open pipelines. Again, there's there's partially open pipelines, but I mean they're they're completely open, but they're not, they're they're still experimental. They're proof of concept. We got about a half dozen of them on the on a open event data website. But we need something completely 100% transparent. Um, and there's no reason not to do that in 2020. We're not we're not you know we can do this. We can easily do this. Um, deduplication, we talked extensively. Again, I think we need to deal with them. Again, there's, there's plenty, of, uh, plenty of ways to do that. And then finally, I, I would go with a general ontology uh, for, for this sort of stuff. And again, there's nothing magic about Plover. Plover really isn't that different it's, it, than, than uh, Cameo, but it does correct some, some problems. And I think it would be much easier to code. And if it's, not, if, if it's something that else, that's fine. I'm not that invested in Plover, but it needs to be something other than Cameo. They say ABC, anything but Cameo. Um, OK, then secondary considerations very quickly. I'm watching the time. It would be great to have benchmarks, so there are a lot of intellectual property issues there, and the same with open training cases. But And if we can somehow resolve that, whether it's synthetic cases or abstraction or licensing, that would be great. Geolocation is an entirely separate program uh, issue. It's a very difficult thing, but again, continued work on that. Um, and then finally, the, these need, I'm not sure what the ultimate technological issue is going to be, machine learning versus dictionary-based approaches. We need to have stuff in from the 2020s, not stuff from, you know, the, the 2000s or which is, is the Tabari or it, which may be what it uses or, or even 2010, which is what I can. We've made a lot of advances in natural language processing and need to incorporate. Them. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, before the Q and A section is, uh, we we are also today very lucky to to have Professor 
Craig Jenkins, and uh, I don't know if you are ready to 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 to, to say something. But uh, if you are, we will be really uh, happy to hear your voice as well. Um, I have to first unmute myself and make sure it worked. I think it did. Uh, yeah? yeah. Yes, we can hear you. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a kind of a conundrum briefly for the early warning, conflict early warning uh, discussion that I've been thinking about and doing some writing on that's not yet published, but, um, and uh, perhaps some people will later have feedback here and then later. Um, conflict early warning, the way we're talking about it here, focuses mostly on the data development and the evaluation and the metrics and um, the best uh, and the comparable different methods to do that and the way to integrate it with other kinds of uh, early warning data. And I think we've gotten, Mo Doug and Phil and others have pretty well laid out much of that uh, conceptual area and the contribution of event data is absolutely critical as we all know. Um, I want to talk briefly about a what I'm going to call the paradox of early warning, conflict early warning and early warning in general, actually. And this is uh, here what I'm really talking about is from the viewpoint of typically the government officials or the IGOs that are in effect the funders of most early warning, uh, conflict early warning efforts, not all of them. Uh, but I think some of the same paradox shows up as well. And the paradox is actually fairly simple. Um, and it comes from a sort of central insight that one realizes when one studies some of these early warning exercises in practice and what quite often happens with them is you begin to realize that for the top uh, political managers, so to speak, in the states and the IGOs and the like that are um, driving this uh, effort, um, their political credit, if you want, does not come from preventing conflict, actually. Um, that's a great humanitarian goal. I endorse it completely. But uh, the real uh, incentive, so to speak, that they operate on is managing conflict. And in some ways, they need crisis. Some level of crisis that, you know, we can talk about that conceptually and how it works, et cetera. But I think a fundamental realistic uh, aspect of the conflict early warning uh, conundrum, if you want, that you have to realize is that we, we who come in from a more human rights, humanitarian point of view, uh, quite often assume that the prevention of conflict is the objective. And actually, that's not the case. Uh, the opposite is true, that actually, in some sense, they need crisis or they need more centrally to manage crisis. And so understanding that that is often the guiding uh, objective, I think is important to people who are working even at the level of trying to develop better metrics and better measures and better data quality, et cetera. Those are all great activities. I love it. I'm engaged in some of it myself uh, at different times. Uh, but the insight that I'm really trying to point out is that crisis is something to be managed for many, certainly political officials, uh, policy people, uh, people who are making sort of fundamental decisions about how to manage crisis. Uh, I can give you just a kind of trite example, but you can think of your own. Um, uh, back in uh, 2015, I was involved with a little group that was trying to figure out, well, what's going to happen with the Syrian war? And a bunch of academics and the like, um, actually the group that I was involved with was in Austria. Um, and I was just sort of a secondary figure in this whole thing, but the key figures were Austrian uh, Institute uh, researchers, peace researchers, and conflict researchers. And essentially what they'd been doing, they'd been monitoring the conflict. They knew that there was gonna be a wave of, of migration, forced migration coming in. There's gonna be a lot of messiness of it, et cetera. It's going to precipitate a political crisis at some level and a lot of controversy, et cetera. And they informed the Aus Austrian foreign minister of all this and a number of other figures uh, in the Austrian government um, who did nothing about it in terms of practice, uh, certainly didn't engage in uh, conflict uh, mitigation. 
uh, in the Syrian war, probably didn't have a lot of capacity to do that anyway. We, yeah, it's a separate question. But um, the point really is that the foreign minister in this case actually let the crisis, so to speak, develop enough to where they could then manage the crisis. Now, they didn't actually use the early warning information as such to do that. That's an interesting part of my comment in a way, because sometimes there's a full disconnect. But they listened very closely to the warning and that migration and conflict associated with it and then domestic ramifications, et cetera, would develop. And that's great. Let's see it happen. And um, in this case, foreign minister, I think, jumped parties later as part of this process. I don't know what the, I forget the specific details, but the point is you could do several, and I think you could do a number of case studies of this process. And what I'm driving home really, I think, is to be aware of the interests and the perspectives of the driver, so to speak, the funders in specific, and they're variable. They're not a homogeneous at all, you, but you do have to understand that their interest basically is managing conflict or managing crisis. And to some degree, they need a crisis to manage. And uh, they need tools that will allow them to manage it or at least anticipate it in a way that they can manage it. And so you have to be, I think, sanguine about exactly what their objective is and fully aware of that. I mean, we typically talk about sometimes about uh, uh, on demand or sort of a service model of uh, uh, early warning and all these exercises. That's, and that's exactly that's part of my point in a way. But you also have to sort of comprehend what the um, real interests are, so to speak, of the, or the driving interests of the architects. Anyway, that, that's sort of a totally off the side kind of comment in a fashion, but I think it's an important profound insight for conflict early warning discussions. And uh, especially for people as naive as myself, say 20, 30 years ago, when I got involved in this discussion, who thought, well, we're going to prevent conflict. Uh, well, anyway, but anyway, so much for that. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, now I would like to give the floor for questions and comments. Uh, you can just raise your hands automatically. And yes, Adi. And I think you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I use two devices. It creates some echo, and when it locks itself, it, these digital problems. Anyway, uh, as a young researcher, I in I, I am in this field for two three years with Adams Project, and I have been exploring, contacting people, working with uh, developers, a lot of stuff. But the main question mostly. Uh, comes uh, like how we measure progress. When we uh, do benchmarks, when we uh, prepare uh, shared tasks uh, and prepare very carefully a data set, people uh, run their systems on it, 2020 models, uh, very good deep learning models, and we have numbers, we chase numbers, perfect. But uh, the phenomena is much more complex. We spend uh, a lot of uh, tremendous uh, amount of time to restrict these conditions so they can be measurable uh, to identify errors but at some point uh, error for an annotator uh, is uh, correct for the other so we hit such stuff and when we uh, change the event definition a bit everything co kind of collapse so uh, as experienced uh, like founding members of this field how do you feel you would measure the progress? How it, uh, where should we expect to be in five, 10 years? Nothing changed in one day, and maybe not in five, but maybe in 10, uh, in consideration with uh, Professor Yankin's uh, comments, like when we create something and put it trans even transparently, uh, for what it is used. We discussed this ethical dimensions yesterday as well. Uh, but this is a big question in my mind uh, as uh, 
I am working full time <laughs> days and nights on this stuff. And thanks again for all of your time. So uh, maybe uh, Professor Schott, uh, yeah, and then uh, if anybody else. I, I'd start with Doug's observation that, I mean, we're in this, that the quality of the data needs to be evaluated with respect to how well it works for models for specific uh, purposes. Uh, and because there is no objective ground truth, the question is, is the data that you're producing improving the, the, the models that you have? And there, again, I think as long as you can get a reasonably long time series like IQs, um, or there's 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 a number of Ben Ben Radford mentioned. You know, there's a number of ways to generate these long time series. You can retrospectively evaluate your models now, <laughs> and the easiest thing on in terms of so so you know we've got lots of of conflict and stability models out there now, and they're all pretty much the same actually. But uh, you can take two different data sets and say, okay, well, that's pretty much what the JRC people did in that last presentation. How, how well is this predicting, you know, given my particular model, whether it's predicting protests or, or coup d'etats or whatever, am I getting an improvement by, say, eliminating the duplicates or uh, getting a representative sample that doesn't oversample Asia, uh, whatever it is. And I think it, but I, I think ultimately it's going to be, how do the models affect, or sorry, how do the data affect the models? And that's very different than the standard computer science problem where you've got a standard data set and you're trying to match, you know, the classification on it or, or, or something like that. So it, well, I, I, it's not very different, but it is different. Uh, but I, I think as long as it's done honestly, uh, and probably for academic work, it will be government contracting work, who knows. Uh, retrospective evaluation is fine. You know, seeing whether you can predict, uh, you know, instability in West Africa in the 1990s. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Doug, how would you feel about this question? Yes, I, I've, um, I would add thing. I, I certainly agree with everything Phil said and would add two things. The first one would be this concept of inclusion needs to be expanded beyond what it was two years ago. In those days, we were monitoring by hand, um, manually, um, state interactions. And that suited a particular purpose at that time. Uh, within 30 years, we began to monitor non-state interactions. And I think that expanded that focus of our inclusion, of our scope of our study. And then we began to question when we got into the auto coding instead of manual coding, we began to question this, um, the uh, repository, the domain of our data. And we began to look at the, what was driving the studies and, and what is presented on the global media is really a function of people who are willing to pay for that. And you won't find too many people who are willing to pay for um, local movements in a country where they don't do trade, period. You're just not gonna find it. And then we moved into government-sponsored, intergovernmental agency-sponsored um, events, and we pushed it down to the ground. And then we began to question, hey, doesn't civil society need to be involved in this, not just the government actors? And so I think, at least in the time that I've been in the field, we have expanded this notion of inclusion usefully, equitably, or that end goal. And, and if there is one, um, one area of inclusion that we haven't addressed, for me, it's the gender issue. Um, there are some countries that we monitor on the ground that we cannot use certain terms because those terms are illegal in those countries uh, and they are commonplace and legal all over the world. So I, I think as we go forward and as we expand our, in, our scope, our building to be more inclusive, um, I think that's a good thing. And it isn't just the issues that I've mentioned. I think Phil had a useful comment about we can't even measure the two biggest the two, the two, the two. There's something fundamentally wrong with that when uh, 
our funding interests are driving something or our, or some other country's political interests. And it isn't just, it certainly is not just China. Um, there are many countries that restrict open reporting and you get a feed that's coming out of them, regardless of whether it's from above with the news or from below on the ground, it's conditioned to fit within those constraints. So I would say one measure of our progress has been the steadily expanding inclusion. And I would also move that to methods, not just the, the entities that I just focus on, but methods. We've gone from literally uh, manual coding of the New York Times industry to, uh, to uh, sparse parsing, to moderated or, or researcher-led um, coding. I think we need a triangulation of all of these. And it isn't just trying to do better with AI. It is trying to triangulate all of these methods to and more useful solutions. And finally, I would say that the, in, in addition to the notion of inclusion, the notion of explaining what we find needs to be remembered at all times. It isn't just a correlation. We have to look at the sequence of the event. Is there a cause? Is there an effect? And for us to concentrate solely on the failures, the violence, I think is misguided. We really have to look at a regular continuous basis at the conditions that lead to that. And much of this is not just boring as, as Bill posed the question to voters. It, it is utterly, um, nobody would pay for it. Nobody wants to pay to monitor things that don't flash up, as, as Craig said, they want they want to prevent conflicts or crises, so just focus on those. Well, you know, if you want to prevent those, then you have to focus on the precursors. So, but you have to be able to explain those. And I and I would argue, no matter how sophisticated your AI methods are, you have to look at the explanations that you're offering for the results and the evidence you can find. And you cannot limit it by any kind of an exclusion of interests, countries, uh, or peoples that uh, may give you a one-sided view of that. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, I'll just add one other comment. I, I think another place that we need to expand is to do a much better job of trying to extract why people are doing things. Uh, so the topic of a protest, particularly if we're moving from these defined groups like you know the Irish Republican Army to these diffuse social movements like like Yellow Vest or Black Lives Matter, uh, and it's not easy, but it's also not impossible. And even if you get some vague notion or of you know is this an environmental protest, a police brutality, is it independence movement, blah blah blah, and that's not in the existing data. Um, thank you. Hmm. I can't talk to her right now. Yeah, I know. I can't talk to her right now. Uh, oh. Whoops. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to sign out because <laughs> I've got another uh, Zoom coming up. But I'll make one comment, which is to amplify what Phil picked up and Doug likewise is. Um, you know, one thing that really has to happen is, just one second, uh, one thing that really needs to happen is to integrate event data with other kinds of data that we have about movements. And I've been working with a small group that's trying to, to uh, develop machine language classifications and codings of, uh, of uh, social media. And uh, that takes you away from events in some respects, but uh, it, in, in the primary focus does. But, the events are embedded in those commentaries. So many of the commentaries or discourse are about events. So that's one direct link up. So, but you can only do that realistically in a very localized specific setting quickly. Uh, the, other, the other comment I'll throw out is we do need a lot more event characteristics. I mean, we need size. I mean, after all, protest volume, demonstration sizes, that's pretty critical. We need topics uh, or claims, claims making and claims activities. Uh, there's uh, Chuck Tilley's work does a pretty good job of classifying that. Several people have worked on other ways to get it claimed. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of success yet at incorporating that. I think it can be incorporated. It's uh, quite often there in the news text. Sometimes it's not. 
Um, so at any rate, that's a couple of comments and apologies. I'm going to have to go away and become another Zoomite. Thank you very much for your time. Bye. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, yeah, so we can take more questions. In the meantime, I have a question is so yeah, we have followed uh, Adam, or you can uh, uh, hello. arrange so, it as you uh, So we, 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 we. Hmm. Rat, you wanna you wanna talk? Well, yes, I uh, I had a question and um, uh, to to the panel in general. I, I kind of had uh, I kind of slightly modified my initial question after dogs. Uh, comments on um, actually his um, presentation as well uh, that protest event databases have different subscribers and they have therefore different uh, sponsors and the as far as I understand from today's uh, and um, to a certain extent um, the um, ar arguments made in the uh, workshop as a whole, uh, the, uh, the focus is kind of on the, um, in terms of academic research, conflict research, conflict resolution, which has specific exigencies, um, particularly the, uh, the focus is on the present, uh, near future in terms of prediction and as a basis of information for understanding the present and near future. Uh, the, a relatively short term um, in, into the past. Uh, the, uh, we, were, we are in our uh, project, Emerging Welfare Project, we're kind of, um, I, I'm not, say, not to say that uh, the present or uh, near present is uh, unimportant for us, but we have rather maybe a, a, a little bit longer term in the, to the past perspective, uh, sort of in the lines of traditional historical sociology. So I was going to ask whether um, that kind of uh, perspective and an overall research design, which incorporates event data, which has its own specific um, exigencies uh, or requirements, um, would that make any difference? Or to what extent it would make a difference in terms of uh, usability of uh, existing and uh, existing databases for for uh, uh, for the most part, and would um, would the issues that uh, we need to concentrate on while uh, while developing while creating our own data set would uh, differ in what ways from uh, the data sets that are specifically or rather more tailored towards. Uh, current events uh, uh, or current conflict resolution monitoring and prediction, etc. Thank you. Yeah, the the short answer is we don't know, but I, I I'm very excited about some of these possibilities because we are getting these very long time uh, timeline uh, data uh, textual databases available, like New York Times that Ben mentioned. There's a data set, I don't really know if it became available, uh, that University of Oklahoma coded called Terrier that coded every single uh, LexisNexis story, uh, political story. They actually got access to those. Um, there's, you know, there, I don't exactly know how you would do it, but, you know, I think, uh, and it would be a big project, but I think you could mine Wikipedia now uh, that and get, a whole bunch of stuff, you know, going back really as far as you want. And again, it's going to be a biased sample. We know lots more about the history of France than we know about the history of the Congo. But, uh, but then there's some other unexploited. I would love to be, actually somebody was doing this, code all these Chinese records that go back almost over 2,000 years now, pretty consistently. Uh, you know, and I think we would start seeing, and this is the sort of micro historical approaches that, that his, you know, that, that some historians have really wanted to do. Uh, and maybe you don't need to go back to the Han dynasty or, or to Rome, but, uh, but even if you could go back a hundred years, uh, that would be great.
if Doc I, I, wants I think, to say something. I, I think Bill uh, essentially um, said what I would have said. And maybe I would just add that um, from what I can understand has been asked that um, if I agree that we should do more of these uh, comprehensive historically framed studies. And when we do that, we absolutely need to make explicit the boundaries, the scope of the data, the purpose of the data, and the assumptions behind those. So in some cases, in almost all cases currently, we measure um, uh, the intensity of the outcome by body counts. They have notorious problems in and of themselves, but they don't begin to manage the loss of livelihood issues, the handicapped issues, the all sorts of issues that are well beyond physical body counts. And so when we make explicit why we chose body counts and we did not choose to look at the number of livestock, uh, if it's in an agrarian community that were lost, or if we did not choose to look at the uh, environmental degradation uh, that would undermine the sustainability. I, I think it's it, looking at the whole problem, nobody's gonna come up with a single answer, but at least in our individual efforts to understand the whole problem, and we need everybody to contribute and from their own perspectives, we need to be humble and we need to be explicit in what we're doing. And humble, um, I think, will make us better scientists. Thank you very much. So maybe I can ask my own question. Uh, so, so, uh, so we are also working, uh, so this is a technical question, but it is, I think, not a purely technical one because of uh, its importance. So I'm talking about China. And so we are collecting data on a wide range of countries and we have the most problem for China because of the censorship. And so we, for, we spent the last more than a year uh, trying to figure out this problem. And so we have, we have used, tested different uh, data sources from mainland China, from Hong Kong. And then the, so the, we did the best source that we could find was the South China Morning Post from, published in, in Hong Kong. Uh, which is published in English, and but still, this is focusing mostly on uh, certain events like Tiananmen, or they are focusing on Hong Kong itself. Uh, it's not a good, it's not a good representation of uh, China in general. And then we try to figure out, uh, complement this uh, sample with international sources, uh, like New York Times, BBC, and some news agencies. But still, these are, they are focusing on big events. Uh, but we are, so we are missing uh, granularity. So we are missing the details, uh, which is what we are exactly interested in. And another, uh, another approach is the, the, the use of uh, social media. Uh, and China doesn't have a Twitter, but they have their own Twitter, Weibo. And we are working with Christian Goebel uh, from uh, VN, and so they, they are uh, extracting and manually coding and then uh, automatically processing this variable data. Uh, but still, uh, the social media has its own limitation. It doesn't go back in time, and its, 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 its capacity and the number of participant users are uh, exploding by over time, etc. Uh, so these are the limitations, and I'm sure you have <clears throat> you have talked uh, uh, you have uh, <clears throat> thought about it. And do you have any uh, ideas or suggestions? I think China is one of the most important countries today, and I'm sure this uh, what our problem will be a general problem of the field. Uh, <clears throat> I think we need to find the solution for this China uh, China problem. So how how are we going to extract protest data from China? And I'm 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 a student of Giovanni Arigi. So and Beverly Silver 
uh, and we know that China is in both in terms of economy and politics, but also in terms of uh, contentious politics, it is becoming and it, it has always been the center of grassroots politics uh, from all peasant uprisings to today's migrant workers uh, protests. Uh, so it is the center of contentious politics and we need to find the solution. Uh, what do you think about it? Do you want to take that first, Phil? Yeah, sure. Uh, the best project I know, and again, I'm not a China expert by any means, is there was a spinoff of uh, two or three of Gary King's Harvard students did this wonderful project that I think is now commercial, uh, where they constantly, constantly, you know, by, by the second, monitor the, uh, the social media in China, in Chinese. Uh, and the, pro the, the weak point in the Chinese censorship is the firewall is not fully automated. In fact, it's, it's not very automated at all. Uh, they they toss, you know, it's being China, they toss hundreds of thousands of human sensors at it, but it's not fully automated. So these, so these protest posts stay up sometimes for hours, but certainly for minutes, and they capture them. And then they can, uh, you know, compare what's censored and what's not and so forth. I, I think that's a commercial, I, I don't know the name of it, but I think they're, they've, they've made a commercial spinoff because obviously lots of people are interested. But I agree, the, the, this is a place where the, the mainstream media is, is not useful at all. And it's, um, yeah, and, and of course, you know, it's only going to get worse with Hong Kong now out of the picture, or it's going to be out of the picture pretty soon. Yeah. So that's the only source. And I, as, I, as a related question, that. how do you compare a traditional news media and the social media in terms yeah. of the quality of... Right. The, I mean, I think the answer on China is, as with so many things about China, it's, it's a unique case uh, that, yeah, and... And at some point, we can start triangulating and see what a protest movement in the U.S. looks like compared to a protest movement in China when we've got good data. But at the moment, we got no data, or except for the, this, uh, this other project. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I would endorse everything there. I think the social media is giving us, especially the New York Times. Doc, of, do, you, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. The connection. Okay, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I would say that the social media, especially near real time monitoring, does give us um, not the protest events per se, but it gives us an insight into the affect or the sentiment and the, in, in turn the contentiousness that is brewing in that society as closed as it is. And I think, um, so first I would endorse any media, social or commercial, to look for it. I would also look at the government statements. There have been, sta there have been very good um, examinations historically about the tone, the operational code of government statements, so to speak, and, and many others. And, and I think that's another way we can triangulate by using this proxy for government statements. Are they calling you a wild pig this week or are they calling you a domesticated dog. I mean, those are seemingly silly, but historically and over time, they make sense and they can help you, as Phil said, triangulate. So, but I would also urge that we need to look for more proxies. And some of these are not, it's gonna be beyond protest events. It might be in the, as we're now finding out with COVID, why did all of the, um, why did some a significant portion of the export of gloves stop in China in December, for example. Uh, you know, that should tell you something. And that I understand that there are people looking at that. So it isn't just um, protest events. It could be other interactions, commercial, financial. It could be um, agricultural. It, 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 and it also could be manifested in um, uh, structural events that take longer, but we cannot rely on waiting for governments to open up for protest events. And for, in the case of North Korea, for example, you have to go into a more of a case study or comparative case study and interview refugees because you're not gonna be able to reliably monitor 
even the sentiment coming out of there because it's even more controlled than China with more uh, disastrous consequences. So I, I would suggest that we all challenge ourselves by looking at proxies for contentiousness. And sometimes these seem amorphous, like how antagonistic is it? But there are measures for antagonism, sentiment, reputation, that kind of a thing. And I think we ought to push in this direction and just think out of the box on proxies. What would it take for you to think that something was happening if it was a complete black hole with news? Think about those things that you would be certain that something was happening if you knew that that was going on, but it wasn't in the news. And I think we need to stretch our imaginations to get those measures. Yeah, just two more comments. One of the results that this this Harvard originally Harvard project came up with, they realized these tweet the social media complaints are not going to be totally shut down because the Beijing needs them to monitor where the dissent is because they can't trust the local governors. So Beijing basically uses the social media to bypass and find out what people are really concerned about. Then they censor it but it's still up there. The other thing we, we haven't talked about, but I think is gonna be increasingly important is commercial remote sensing. Uh, because these mass activities, as we get more and more of these pretty high quality remote sensing, you're gonna be able to see crowds in the street and, and a mass demonstration can be spotted from, from remote sensing. It looks very, very different than anything else. Uh, so we may start needing to use those. Okay, thank you very much. And we have a, a few more minutes, and I think we can take another question if you have. May, may I just, I, I just want to, before we close, I just want to express my gratitude towards the organizers. Um, the eclectic nature of the presentation, and yet the coherent focus was really stimulating, and I appreciate being able to participate, and I'm honored by being asked to say it. So thank you very much. You too. Yeah, I, I would say the same. When, when I first saw your announcement, I thought this is amazing uh, that, that there's, there's enough interest in this to put it in, in a conference like this. When we get this turnout at school. Yeah, this is just, just incredible job. Yeah, just to note, uh, many because uh, maybe we announced uh, the video recordings will be shared. Many people just ask me to be to make sure they will have the recordings. I will send you e emails again to get to ask for your permission. But uh, if now there is twenty people, at least twenty other people waiting for the recordings, so they would. Uh, have, <laughs> they would watch them in their time. Therefore, the interest is really amazing and we got 230 registrations and all from scholars uh, from various fields. And I find this uh, event uh, like the computational people, they are not around, we have only a couple of them, uh, machine learning and computational linguistics. And uh, our next step will be to go to some conference where they are uh, uh, to their conferences and try to get their attention and maybe get more technical insight. Uh, there was one more. Yeah, and we will be in automatic knowledge-based construction conference. It is in June uh, 22nd. We will uh, tell about data set creation, called standard data set creation efforts. And uh, with all these, I just want to say there is interest of maybe much more. And your contribution mm -hmm. made it, uh, maybe it doubled the interest, to be honest, like because uh, they know you are here and that will have some quality. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much and for your time in difficult days and I hope you will have, we will have better days and uh, I really wish uh, a great summer for all of you and I would like to thank you, uh, Professor, for your for your 
contribution, and I would like to thank all the uh, all other colleagues for their participation. And we really hope to see you in person soon. <laughs> Uh, I guess uh, Erdem's connection is not uh, very stable. Uh, are you, Erdem, are you there? Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah there. I can't hear you now. I was just saying yeah. I hope to see you in person soon. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, guys.